Yo, what is going on, Papa Fam? Welcome back to another banger of a build. I am excited. This is going to be one fun, different kind of project that we've ever done on this channel. So let me know where you're watching from right now. It's good to be back. We're over 200,000 subscribers in the Papa Fam. That's the energy I want to start this video on. We've already got hundreds watching all over the world. This is what I'm talking about. It's the Papa Fam energy. Welcome to the Amazon Web Scraper tutorial. Today you're going to learn all about how to scrape data the correct way off of websites that are unscrapable like Amazon. I'm going to break it down. I'm going to make it easy. We're going to be powering the entire build with bright data and I'm going to go ahead and give you a demo right now in a second. We've got Cape Verde in the house. We've got the UK in the house. We've got US in the house. Let me know where you're watching from right now and I want to go ahead and shout you guys out before we get started. Welcome to today's build Papa Fam. Papa Fam, check it out. The web scraper, scraping the unscrapable. Oh, coming up with some taglines these days. <laughs> we got Iran in the house, Tunisia, Latvia, Philippines, Indonesia, India, North Korea, Bulgaria, Germany, Nigeria, Jacksonville, Florida, Kenya, Tokyo, Japan, Nepal. I can't even make it up because it's so fast to come. Finland, this is what I'm talking about. Italy in the house, that is what I'm talking about. Morocco, California, what? This is mad. This is actually crazy. There's so many people around the world watching. What's up, guys? Welcome to today's stream. This is what we're going to be building, right? So it's literally a fun, real functional web scraper. What I mean by a web scraper is it's literally, imagine like a a bunch of different proxies, a bunch of different computers are going ahead, going over to Amazon, scraping this information, pulling it into our website. And it's doing all of this and it's all powered by webhooks, Firestore, Bright Data as a platform. All of this is going to be taught to you today. Yeah, I was testing out a bunch of different things like Hello World pulls up these results, who would have thought? And we also pull a bunch of other information such as the previous price, delivery dates, other statistics, just like that. And I'm going to teach you how to do all of this in today's video. So quick little breakdown of what we're learning today. We are going to be covering Next.js 13.2, which just got released. Lee Robinson dropped an amazing video over on Vassell. So I went ahead, practiced a bunch of this. We're going to show you a bunch of that stuff today. I'm not going too far into Next.js uh, Next 13.2 but we're going to do a lot of next chess 13 stuff so it's going to be a hell of a lot of fun and we're going to go ahead and cover how to go ahead and build out your first ever webhook which is pretty damn cool if you've never seen a webhook on this channel because i have done them in a couple of builds only the ogs will remember that i'm going to show you how to do all of that and of course we're going to keep the staples like typescript like tailwind all of that good stuff so your knowledge just keeps on going up and up and up while you're watching these videos okay so today's video is going to be powered by the guys over at bright data and let me give you a quick demo before we get started we can actually go ahead and delete some specific searches but if i was to go ahead and actually type in a search term for example macbook pro what we're going to see is it starts a scraper for macbook pro this is going to initialize a scraper on bright data's platform and then this will go ahead and pop up on the left hand side in a real-time fashion this is going to be really powerful it's going to be something which is going to be i'm going to explain and break down the entire functionality of this in just a short second but i want to show you what it's actually doing behind the scenes so it's actually setting up a new web scraper from the platform known as bright data and then bright data is actually going to go ahead collect all the results come back to the page just like this you can see right now so here it's actually scraping the results from amazon so what it's actually doing is imagine it's going over here typing in macbook pro and then it's going to go ahead and start pulling all of this information in i'm obviously in dubai that's why you can see dubai pricing but this will go ahead and pull in america's pricing because that's what we did to uh, go ahead and program the uh, scraper to do and this is all powered by bright data so bright data let me introduce them right and my absolutely incredible platform now the problem with sites like amazon is they're quite clever they don't want us to scrape their data and they actually have a lot of measures in place which stop us from scraping with traditional python or normal javascript approaches so what companies like bright data do is they have incredibly vast proxy networks and essentially what this means is you have tons and tons of different ips across the world so think of loads of different computers on this massive network and then they go ahead and go ahead and scrape the pages for you based on the code that we provide to bright data so essentially we're kind of getting a best of both worlds we're providing a sense of scraping code but then it's actually using real computers and real devices which amazon can't detect and then it goes ahead and pulls the data and we go ahead and store it in our database 
but I'm not doing it just a normal REST API route. I'm actually going ahead and using webhooks to populate a Firebase database, then go ahead and populate my client's app. So a whole load of stuff to go ahead and learn in today's video, right? So this is the scraper that you're gonna go ahead and learn how to build. The code for this is in the third link in the description for the scraper template. I'm gonna show you how to get everything set up. Do not worry. And you can go ahead and get signed up with Bright Data with $15 free credit to follow along with this tutorial today by the, using the first link in the description, okay? I wanna mention as well, they have incredibly powerful web scrapers. They also have loads of massive data sets that you can go ahead and use, such as all of the you know, TikTok data, Walmart's product data, Amazon product data, that's super valuable. Trust me when I say that. It's actually a hugely valuable thing to be able to access and get access and, and do whatever you want to. And essentially what you're doing here is you're turning websites into structured data that you can then process and do whatever the hell you want with, okay? They are GDPR and CCPA compliance so there's loads of stuff that if you're ever worried about that kind of stuff don't stress that's why they have 15,000 customers and a 99.9% .9 uptime guarantee but without further ado let's go ahead and build some of this cool stuff in right I see loads of OGs in the house code with Guillaume Manji we've got Fabian Van Dyke this is what I'm talking about and I'm always throwing myself in the deep end I just want you to know that I'm trying to learn some incredibly difficult stuff so yeah Make sure you go ahead and subscribe if you haven't already and smash the like button if you enjoy the content and you want me to keep on making more stuff like this, right? So to mention as well, this is going to be powered up by Firebase. You can see over here, we have all of the different records inside of our database and this is being populated in real time, right? So all of this is gonna go ahead and get populated and then it will go ahead and return to our application. So tons and tons of stuff. Now, if you do find any of this content extremely confusing, and you just don't know where to begin, then make sure you check out our course over at Zero to Full Stack Hero, right? Paparreact.com forward slash course. The links are all in the description if you get confused. Go ahead, check it out. If you've got zero experience and this is kind of going like way over your head, you can feel free to go check out our course. It's honestly, I put my heart and soul into that thing. So it will, I promise you, it will take you from your beginner levels all the way up to when you're absolutely just confident as hell. And then of course, if you can't or you don't want to do that, feel free, just enjoy these videos. That's what we're here for. Without further ado, let's go ahead and let's build out our first application, our web Amazon web scraper. I'm just gonna show you right now. You can go ahead and actually see that loads of different results are gonna go ahead and get thrown in. We also get the React hot toasters, all that good stuff is gonna go ahead and work for us just like we want it to, okay? So let's go ahead and dive into the beginning of this build and let's get this thing going. So 250 people already, what? That's crazy, guys. There's already 250 people. All I ask is you just destroy that thumbs up button before we get started in this build. So if you haven't already, just drop a like and it helps this video push out to as many people as possible because you guys loved the chat GPT build I dropped, which was incredible, right? So let's get into today's build. Let's just get started with this. So head over to tailwindcss.com and we're going to go ahead and use the creating your project starter template. So this one right here simply uses the create next app command with the template Tailwind CSS and then you pass in the name and this will just set up a Next.js app in with Next.js 13.2, let me say, and it's going to go ahead and um, uh, include Tailwind CSS to begin with. So I'm going to open up my terminal. I like to work always in a clean directory fashion. So I'm going to throw it inside of my documents, my builds folder. You don't have to do that. I like to keep things neat. And then I'm going to go ahead and paste in that command. But I want to change the name of this. I want it to be called Bright Data. And I'm going to call, go ahead and call it Amazon Scraper. And I'm going to say YouTube as well, okay? Go ahead, hit enter. That's going to kickstart my template building process. Okay, so this is going to go ahead and get everything set up. Let me go ahead and read the comments while this is happening. We've got loads of people from Mumbai in the house. Some people are enjoying the sanity content. That's awesome. I see you. The Costa goes, let's go. Keep it up, Sunny. Uh, Cody Guillaume says, of course I'm subscribed. That's the energy I want, right? This is incredible. We've got Nigeria in the house. What is up, Adiola? That's awesome to see everyone. And guys, this is just crazy. The fam is getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And I can't stress. And honestly, we just get, we just keep growing as a family. It's absolutely incredible, right? Let's go ahead and jump into this uh, folder. So CD Bright Data. Uh, you can see I've got loads of builds here. Amazon Scraper YouTube is the one I'm looking for. And then I'm going to go ahead and type in code dot. Okay. And this will go ahead and open up a VS Code in the correct folder directory. Right. And then I'm going to go ahead and remember, this is going to be recorded. This is going to be put up afterwards so you can feel free to follow along afterwards. Uh, and if you feel like this is a little bit too fast. OK, so in this case, this actually gives us a Next.js 12 
structure, right? Although you straight away have Next.js 13 by setting this up and you can check by hovering over Next. And at the point that this video was made, the latest version of Next, I believe was 13.2.3, okay? So just like you know, um, <coughs> let's go ahead and sort this out, right? So now we're gonna go over to the pages folder and I'm gonna show you that typically this is where you start off when you follow things in the Next.js 12 approach. Okay, we're not going to do this. We're going to do it in a, in a way whereby we are going to use the Next.js 13 app directory, which is what I want all of you to start getting used to and understanding. Okay, so in this case, what we're going to do is we are going to go ahead and do Command J and we're going to spin up our app. So let's go ahead and get this thing set up. I'm going to close my previous application so it doesn't block the host. Let's go ahead and do yarn run dev. And I'm doing yarn because I simply have a yarn lock file. All right. So one second. <coughs> So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and open up a preview window so we can see this. So I'm going to do localhost 3000, pop this over to a side, and then I'm going to go ahead and you should see this. So this is obviously loading from the Next.js 12 directory right now. So the pages API or pages folder, sorry. And uh, oh, thank you so much. Harish says you are the one of the best developers on the whole of YouTube. I appreciate you, dude. And in fact, I'm going to share with you guys some new songs from our soundtrack. This is actually, it's just so nice to code with this stuff. I think it was, was it this one? Now these are the other ones. Where is it going? Okay, I mean, I think it's this one. Oh yeah, I love this stuff. All right, you can get access to the entire playlist, by the way. All you gotta do is head over to the description. There's a link down there somewhere where it says, I get access to the playlist and you just pop your email in, we'll send it to you. All right, so let's go ahead and get started. So. Also, if you haven't already seen, okay, we'll, we'll touch on that in a second. So how do we go ahead and convert this to a Next.js 13 uh, app? So let's go ahead and do that first. So what we wanna do is we wanna go into the package JSON level, create a folder called app. Okay, that's the first step. Then we're gonna go ahead and create a page.tsx file. This is the new convention inside of Next.js 13 for creating our home route, okay? I'm gonna type in RFCE, which are lovely snippets. I'm gonna go ahead and clean this up a little bit. And I'm gonna simply rename this to homepage. Okay, now with that done, we're gonna go ahead and show you how the hell I just made that happen. So simply make sure that you've got the ES7 snippets installed to go ahead and do that RFCE trick that I just went ahead and done. Okay, so if you haven't, if you're wondering, how did you do that? That's how I did it, okay? Now, what I want you to do at this point is go into your next config. So this is where we need to go into our next config and we need to go ahead and say experimental. And here we're gonna enable the app directory. Okay, now once this is done and you hit refresh, you're gonna see a, oh no, we changed the next config, so we need to go ahead and restart our server. So let's go ahead and restart our server. And what we should see here is we get an error, okay? We should get an error at this point. So if I go ahead and refresh, you can see, oh, it goes ahead and screams at us. It says conflicting pages are found. Like, and the reason why this is happening is you have two pages fighting for the home screen at this point, right? You have the page.tsx, which is fighting for the home page, and then you have the index.tsx. You can't have one, both of these, right? You can only have one because you can only have one forward slash localhost terminal, right? So as in localhost root. So at this point, what we gotta do is pretty simple. What we gotta do is go ahead and delete the, this one. Okay, get rid of it. Now we go ahead and say h1, hello world. So hello world, hit save, bam, clean things up a little bit, hit refresh. And just like that, we should see in a second, let me go ahead and restart the terminal. So let's go ahead and restart our server, you're on run dev. And then I'm gonna go ahead and hit a refresh. And what we should see is it creates a layout.tsx file for us. So this is what's really nice about Next.js 13 is that if we didn't have a layout file for us, it actually creates it for us on the fly. And as you can see here, we've got the new Next.js 13.2 metadata, which is the SEO enhancement that they recently introduced. So in this case, you can go ahead and enhance the metadata of the page, which massively boosts your SEO performance. So this means the things that you're basically gonna go ahead and see, or what Google is essentially gonna see when it's scraping the pages, right? So in this case, we could go ahead and call this one, the Amazon Web Scraper. And if we go ahead and inspect this, I'm gonna show you just a quick little brief kind of a showcase of what that actually just did. So if we look inside the new, the head, you can now see the title changes based on the new layout, uh, the new metadata component, uh, 
attributes at the top, right? All you have to do is export const metadata and then you can go ahead and pass things in. And you can really pass in as much as you want. And if you have dynamic metadata, you can even do generate metadata, which is a special function, which I'm not going to go into today. I do cover that in Zero to Full Stack Hero, but that is actually something which means that you can actually go ahead and have custom SEO metadata, dynamic information loaded on the head component as you need it, which is really powerful. Okay, so this is where all of our uh, stuff gets loaded. So the layout is basically rendering out. The children is essentially the page. So this is our starting point. Now you're probably wondering, that does not look like Tailwind CSS. And the reason you're probably, you're, you're, damn, you're right. Okay, you're damn right for that. So at this point, if we go over to the layout, we need to go ahead and import something. So if you head over to underscore app.tsx, you'll see that previously this was the entry point. We can actually get rid of this. So instead, I'm going to go ahead and import the styles and the globals.css is it responsible for pulling in all of our tailwind. So if I go ahead and hit save now, you'll see it strips off the old styling and we have our tailwind blank canvas. Okay, so let's go ahead and get rid of the and underscore app.tsx. We don't need that anymore. And even the app, um, even the API now is uh, supported inside of the app directory with the new route.ts file, okay? So in the code, I don't think I changed it, but we can change it, screw it, I might just do it live, okay? So I'm gonna show you how we can do that as well. So page.tsx, hello world. So let's go ahead and see what we have to build. So what I'm actually gonna do is I'm gonna run my old app so I can show you something on the screen as we go ahead and have this build take place. So I'm loaded it up at localhost 3001. So let's go ahead and pop that open. And as you can see, we have our old app, right? And I've left this in the pending state just to demonstrate the loading. Um, so I've actually done this purposely so you can actually see the loading state and all this kind of stuff. So on the back end, I canceled something so that way it's just gonna be stuck in the pending state so you guys can see all the different states that we have to go ahead and build. Right. So in this case, this is what we want to eventually get to. And it is also mobile responsive. So you can see how it's really nicely responsive on a phone and all that good stuff. So I'm going to show you how we can build all of this in today's video. OK, so first thing I want to show you uh, is essentially let's go ahead and have a look at our uh, page .tsx. I'm just getting all my screens cleaned up. We're going to go ahead and introduce the first page. So if I go ahead and remove my local host and we just go to our home page, I want to see this page, right? I want to see this right here. So this is going to consist of a sidebar and it's going to consist of the page itself. So as you can see here, I'm just going to go ahead and make this a bit cleaner. We have the actual page.tsx element right here. And then we have the sidebar over here. So essentially we have two different elements, okay? Thank you, Nicholas. He goes, thank you, Sonny. Keep more of that good stuff coming. I appreciate you, dude. This is bothering me so much. It's just a tech center that I needed to add. Um, I will fix that. <laughs> it's, it's, it's really bothering me. Um, but I'll show you how we do that. Also, with, I didn't get to mention, we are actually going to be covering how to deploy your own cloud function. So we are going to be covering Firebase cloud functions today as well. And I'm going to teach you how to use the NGROC tunneling technique to go ahead and actually demo or develop locally things like cloud functions. So that way you can put them in places where a webhook is expected when you're developing locally. And then when it's ready, you can finally deploy it. Incredible stuff. You're going to learn all about it today. Okay. So let's continue on strong. So the first thing I want to do is basically build out this portion here, right? So this portion here just consists of simply a uh, icon. Welcome to Amazon Web Scraper and then a bunch of text, okay? So how do we do that? Well, it's fairly straightforward. We are gonna be using hero icons today. So I'm gonna show you right now. We go to heroicons.com. This is actually backed by the guys over at Tailwind CSS. So you simply head into the documentation and then we go down here and you guys can see npm install hero icons. I'm not gonna be using npm install. I'm gonna be using our handy uh, yarn add, okay? Because I'm using yarn. So in this case, I'm gonna say yarn add hero icons react. This will bring in the hero icons react package into my application. Okay, then what you do is you can see you've got a bunch of different examples over here. So I recommend you take that. Then you simply change the icon for whichever one you need. You also have a solid outline, different variants. And as you can see, you can get those variants by simply searching over here. So if I type in search, you can now see we get the outline, solid or the mini variants. Okay, so you can feel free to use them as much as you need to. Thank you, Faisani. Goes amazing build, Sunny. I appreciate you, dude. Thank you so much. So this is how I go ahead and find the different search elements or the different icons, okay? So once we've done that, I'm gonna do a simple import at the top, Command J to hide my terminal. Let's pop in my document magnifying glass icon. And then I'm gonna go ahead and simply build this out. So 
inside of here, I'm going to get rid of Hello World and I'm going to start populating what we need. So I'm going to get rid of this. I'm going to have another div inside here. And I'm going to go ahead and actually pull in my document magnifying glass icon. And I'm going to be using Tailwind CSS. So it's going to be a bunch of Tailwind styling inside of this build. So I'm going to set the height and width of 64. And what we should see on the screen is that icon should pop up. There you go. So if you're getting to this point, amazing stuff. Make sure you destroy that thumbs up button. And what I love about Tailwind is you get this color palette as well. And this is actually introduced with the extension. So make sure you also have the extension hand in hand when you build this out. So if I go over to my Tailwind CSS, you can see this one right here. Make sure you install it. 2.6 million people will agree. So definitely go ahead and do that. And then here we're going to say text indigo. And I'm going to do 600, I believe was a magic one. And to be honest with you, I think it's a bit too bright. So what you can do is you can do forward slash and then add in 20. And this will give it a 20% opacity on top. It's like a shorthand, right? So that actually helps you out a little bit more. Guys, we're almost about to break 300 likes already. That's insane. Make sure you go ahead and destroy that like button. Let's get this video climbing through the ranks. I appreciate every single one of you. I think we can hit over a thousand likes today. Keep on, keep it coming. Uh, this the energy what we're talking about right so after this is done we're gonna have an h1 tag and i'm gonna say welcome to the amazon web scraper okay go ahead and hit save and then i'm gonna do class name and here we've got the text to be 3x so i want it to be slightly larger i'm gonna keep on hitting save so you can actually get a nice little preview yourself so text 3xl margin top of two the text should be black and i want to make it a font bold margin bottom of five oops font bold margin bottom of five there you go okay and the reason why i did text black here or even though it's already black is because you can actually go ahead and make it like a, a 50 percent opacity if you didn't want to go ahead and write opacity 50 just nice little tricks like that right obviously this one was a bit pointless but if you want to know those tricks it's just handy to go ahead and know that they exist right the next thing i want to do is just pop a bit of text in here and i'm basically going ahead and plug in saying if you want to go ahead and learn how to code feel free to join us at Zero to Full Stack Hero, okay? They're very simple to go ahead and, and join us. Just head over to popperia.com and you guys can feel free to join the community of awesome Popify members, right? Let's go ahead and style this out a little bit more. So now we've got a little bit more nice styling. I'm actually, I'm actually gonna go ahead and send to that text. It looks a bit cleaner. Uh, in fact, what I might do is also send to this one as well because it looks a bit weird if it's not both centered, okay? And then after that, we've got H3 and this is just simply going to be a link, right? So you can feel free to turn that into a link yourself. I'm just popping in things like that, okay? I'm going to text center as well. And if you do want to shorthand this, you can make the overall outside div text center and it will make all the children uh, text center as well, okay? So at this point now, what I want to do is head over to flex. I'm going to make the entire div a flex div. So you can see what happens is by default, it's going to go in a row, Okay, unless you're on React Native, I'm not going to get into that. So we're going to make it a column instead. I'm going to say the items should be in the center and we can justify those items in the center as well. Okay, so that's more on the vertical axis. And then we're going to give the outside uh, a flex container as well. We're going to say that's a flex column. We're going to centralize those as well. So item center and justify everything in the center as well so justify and center to be honest with you i don't actually think we need this one i think i had this before so i'm going to go ahead and clean up our code as well get rid of that make life a bit easier there you go that's what we wanted right sometimes i forget to clean up stuff so there you go that was an example so at this point now we've got the page looking pretty decent and what i like about this is now you can split up your logic by having the page and the layout tsx file handling different areas right so your page you want it to keep and kind of keep it as simple as possible the goal that we want to do is essentially have the page of TSX, which is loaded into children or any other page gets loaded into children here. And then we can actually have other things be part of the layout. So what do I mean by this? Well, what we can do is if we go ahead and pop the body out and we're simply going to make a main tag and I'm going to pop this in and say the children is the main tag. Okay. But what, what if I want to have a sidebar on all of my pages? So in this case, I'm going to create a sidebar property. So I'm going to add a comment here just for that. And then for the actual pages themselves, next to the main page content on top of it, I always want to have a header. Okay. So you can see I'm starting to mark things out just like so. So what I want to do is prepare my folder structure. So I'm going to go to package JSON, create a folder, and I'm going to call it components. Okay, and let me know if the music's good right now. BRD says, hello from France. What's up? Most of you says from Zimbabwe. That's awesome stuff. Uh, welcome to the stream, guys. 
We just passed over 300 likes. That's what I'm talking about. Let's get to 500, Papa Fam. Already at 300. The video's barely started. That's mad, right? We can get to 500 very shortly. Let's do it, right? So we've got the layout done. So inside of the components folder now, I want you to create a sidebar.tsx. So sidebar.tsx. And I just want to worth, it's worth mentioning um, that this code will be available in the Papa GitHub repo after. Okay, so make sure if you are, you know, you can follow along for absolutely free. But if you do want to go ahead and get access to the code, you know, if in case you're debugging or whatnot, definitely check out the Papa GitHub repo. There's over like 40 builds in there now. It's incredible right, how much we've managed to put in there now. It's crazy, honestly. I remember when it was one build. <laughs> it's, it's just time flies. Um, so at this point, we are now building the sidebar. Okay, so you can see right here, we've got the sidebar itself. So I'm going to go ahead and build that out right now. And how do we do that? So I'm going to go ahead and make this a little bit bigger, just like so. And then I want to have this a div inside of here. And then I'm going to have an unordered list. The unordered, the unordered list, my mouth's going a bit crazy, is going to represent this, all of the different elements on the screen. And then the top portion is going to represent, you know, the sort of logo section. And I'm going to fix this annoying little text that we've got just floating there in the left. Right? So <clears throat> over here, I'm going to go ahead and pop in my dog, uh, the, the same magnifying glass icon that we had previously. So I'm going to go ahead and push that in over there do my import trick like so. And the way I did that, by the way, was I went to the end of the text, control space bar, enter, and like that, it would go ahead and pop in, okay? And then we've got our, you can't actually see anything right now because we're not actually pulling it in. So let's go to layout. Let's actually pull in the sidebar, just like so. Get rid of this over there. And now you can see the sidebar is popping in. Obviously, by default, it's in line, right? So everything is gonna be, oh no, sorry, by default, everything's block, which means they just kind of stack up full width. But eventually we're going to change it. We're going to add in some flexbox. We're going to add in some grid, all that kind of stuff, right? I'm going to put, turn on the music a bit more and uh, we're going to have a quick little water break. But this is going to be where we get into a little bit of a flow state and we just go in and we just build this entire app. I see some OGs in the house right now in the stream. It's so cool to see everyone. Right, let's go ahead and carry on. So sidebar.tsx. We've got the, we're going to add in after this, we're going to add in the H1. And here I'm going to say web scraper. Okay. And then we're going to have an H2, which says scraping the unscrapable. I just thought that was kind of a cool, cool little uh, catch, catchphrase, right? Scraping the unscrapable, right? And then we've got for the, this one, we're going to go ahead and say, it's going to be hidden on small screens. So by default, everything's mobile first when you're doing Tailwind, okay? So it's hidden on the small screens. But on the medium screen, I want it to become an inline element, okay? And then I'm going to give it a text 3XL, and I want it to be a margin top of 2, right? Now you can see on a small screen, it's hidden. But the minute I get to a medium screen or above, it will pop inline, and then the text kind of comes into play. Okay? And the same for H2. I'm going to say class name, hidden, medium screen, inline, and then we're going to say text should be extra small and I want it to be italic. Give it a little bit of a cinematic-y nice feel, right? Let's actually pop that over there for now so we can see it, okay? And then for the surrounding div, this is going to be a flex column. Okay, so that pops it over the top. Then we're going to say items should be centrally aligned. So items on the center. And then we're going to say justify them on the center as well, okay? And now after that, I'm going to give it a little bit of spacing from this bottom component by saying margin bottom of 10. And that just gives a little bit of breathing room. But obviously, we're not going to actually have these stacked up on top of each other. This is going to be more so for the list underneath afterwards. What we're essentially going to have here is a bunch of sidebar rows. So these are going to represent, these are going to be represented by sidebar row components. So imagine that's going to pop in at the bottom over there. But Pesh says, hey, Sonny, you're, you've changed, you're great. You changed my life. That's, dude, that's incredible, man. Thank you so much for sharing messages like that. It is, it's unreal when I hear stuff like that. So I appreciate you. Thank you for tuning into these streams. We're climbing. We're nearly at 500 likes. I'm telling you, I see the likes are flying up, guys. That's what I'm talking about. Um, so let's continue on. So for this point, after the div here, this is where we're going to change it all to what we want it to be, okay? So pay attention. On small screens, I want a padding of two, okay? And then as it gets bigger, I want to do a padding of 10. So after a medium screen, it's going to get a padding of 10. 
Then I'm going to say padding y of 6. So I'm going to override either or. Of the, so the y is going to be 6, right? You could just do padding x and x. But I'm, I'm lazy sometimes, but that's fine. And then we're going to add an overflow in. So if you ever have to scroll on here, it's going to have a scrollable element, right? So I want it to have a scroll bar when we need it. So what I do is I type in overflow y. Uh, auto auto means that it doesn't show when it doesn't need to but it shows when it is basically overflowing okay if you had overflow why scroll it's always going to be showing which i don't want all right then we're going to say a border on the bottom and this gives us a nice little border on the bottom there you see that and then we're going to say border should be indigo 500 and i'm going to give it a 50 percent opacity okay so a nice little subtle border okay and then now that that's kind of in place and it looks kind of semi-decent what we can do is firstly i want to show you so you see that's what we kind of wanted okay so now what we need to do is we need to reconfigure our layout okay so this is what's actually going to tie everything really together so it kind of doesn't look so silly and it looks kind of nice together right so the first thing i want to do is in the body i'm going to go ahead and say that the class name is a flex now flex is going to naturally put things in a row okay and this is where we get that same problem so what i'm going to do is go back to my sidebar and where i had a web scraper and even where i had this text i actually want to central or center all of this but i don't want the sidebar row to get affected so what i'm actually going to do is only apply text center to these elements here so text center and what i did there was i pressed on this and i did option click and i have multi cursors okay so really really nice little trick that you can do and there you go nice little center centered component okay so inside of the layouts we're going back over here we're going to say on the medium screen it should go into a flex row oh, actually it's already your own flex row i forgot to change that so we don't need that anymore i'm going to say the background color is going to be represented by a custom slight gray that i've decided so i'm going to go ahead and give this a nice little gray i actually want to give a very subtle color right behind this so if we go ahead and do that you can see that actually did change color it's now it's now like a very slight tinge of gray right raj pre saying what is up guys he says what's up guys that's good good to see you in the house dude so we've got the custom background color and then i say a height of a screen okay and this pushes it down so the reason why i want to do that little border is because i like to emphasize when you're learning that that's actually going to push it to the bottom okay so in this case you see when i do height of screen bam it goes all the way to the bottom and there's a reason why we want to do that because that allows us to have this sort of scrolling functionality that i expect and i like right um siri is in the house what's up he goes adnan says much love and much respect from syria for the best content for modern technology on youtube papa react i appreciate you man thank you so much right so at this point we're now going to get for the main so where we have the header and the children which we haven't built the header yet but i'm going to go ahead and style it anyway i'm going to say the class name and over here see, just there's just no padding right we obviously want to have a bit of padding so i'm going to give it a padding of 10 and immediately you can see things start spacing out i'm going to say that the max width of the main area should be 7xl so that's going to be a restricted so if i was to go ahead and zoom out it's going to eventually have a max width constraint right so that way it's, it doesn't ever get too wide so if you're on like a 6k display or something it's not gonna span a huge amount right so width full and then we do mx auto now if you notice when i did it before it wasn't centering right so what's actually happening now is this will use up the space it needs to and then over here what we're actually doing is i'm going to draw this out so imagine this was my sidebar then you've got your max width constraint being applied but your mx um your margin x of auto is determining this space by itself right so without mx auto it doesn't centralize itself so this would be kind of pushed over here without mx auto but with mx auto it basically makes sure that it stays in its max width constraint so in this case this is the max width 7xl being applied so that constraint right there and if you obviously you did 6xl it gets smaller and so forth mx auto makes it center okay i'm trying to do a lot more drawing on the screen i find it always helps people out when especially when you're in the beginning of your journey okay so mx auto is in place we're going to do overflow y auto and then i'm going to say that the scroll bar also i'm actually going to start the scroll bars afterwards it's cool so that's actually a good starting point right so you can see start to see where we're going to go from here right so eventually we're going to get to a point where it looks something like this right and again just to let you know this is deliberate i did cancel this on the back end so that way you know you're not seeing you get to see all the transition states as we build it out okay so once this is done now what we're going to do 
is I am going to. And I just I just realized something earlier. Oh yeah, that's actually fine. So here you can see that's not actually the outline that I wanted. I kind of spotted that randomly. So on the sidebar, you can see it's the outline variant. All I need to do is change that to a solid variant, and I get this nice little solid color instead. Right, that looks a bit cleaner. And also something which is pet peeving me. I'm gonna give it a margin bottom of two. There you go. A little bit of breathing room. I'm also gonna bold it out a little bit. Font bold. Right. So from there, it's better. Little things, little things for me that bother me right so much. Guys, we're climbing almost at 500 likes. Come on, wait, that number is climbing way faster than I thought. Okay. So at this point now, I'm going to build the header. Now the header, so we're pausing on the sidebar. I'm going to go over here to the central page portion and the header represents the search. So the search is going to be actually really important because the search is going to be responsible for when I type in a value, it's going to go ahead and add in a new scraper or initialize a new scraper. So let's go ahead and do that right now. So heading over to our sidebar, what I want you to do is go ahead and type in in your components create a new folder called header.tsx right now in here i want you to do rfce to create a new functional component and then we can go ahead and get rid of that as we don't no longer need that in the top now for the header what we can do is we can actually change the firstly the tags we want to be seo performance we're going to tell you know, any google or bots or any of that stuff that that is a actually a header right then what i'm going to do is put a form in so this is a little trick so if we're ever having like a search field where we want to have the behavior whereby we type in hit enter and then it submits the form that's where we go ahead and use something like a form okay so um kowalski says hey man your tips and tutorial are really helpful to me to understand some concepts of react and redux and react especially firebase connection with those thank you for all your work i appreciate you thank you so much for tuning in right so we've got the input field and i'm going to go ahead and put this over here we've got an input field and we have a button called search right and obviously i've left this in here oops we've got a button called search okay and i'm actually going to show this right now by heading over to my layout.tsx and simply getting rid of my little annotation here and actually popping in the header itself Right. that looks good and now we can see our search field over there so my button right now is there i can type in my input field so let's close that go back to our header now what i'm actually going to do is i'm going to hide the button i'm actually going to say it's a hidden button and you're probably wondering why would you do that because i actually want the the, the kind of the ui to be very sleek so i'm going to have a placeholder which says search dot 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 and then i'm actually going to try and make this a little bit easier for you lot to see there we go okay and then <laughs> inside well, underneath, I'm actually going to have a magnifying glass icon. All right, so underneath the button, I'm going to have a magnifying glass icon. And this will be, in fact, a solid magnifying glass. So I'm going to go down one. And as you can see, we're going to create this custom sort of search field, right? So the way we get it to look the way that I... I don't like the way it looks right now. <laughs> I'm, I'm just throwing that out there. I want it to look super clean. So I'm going to go to my form. And uh, I'm going to chuck in the class name. I'm going to say flex items should be centrally aligned and look keep pay attention to this port part over here item center i'm going to say it needs a space x of two as you can see the little that moved away a little bit then we're going to say justify center as well so it goes into the middle of the x-axis we're going to round the corners off surrounded so four i'm going to give it a padding y of two a padding x of four background should be an indigo but a very subtle 100 and I need to give it a max width of a medium, right? So that, as you can see, if you don't ever wonder like, where the heck is it actually building to, hover over it, it will tell you 28 RAM if you have got the extension installed. And then MX Auto, just to keep things 100% centrally aligned. And as you can see, guys, that's actually beautiful, right? That looks really good, except for this little ugly background portion right there. But I'll show you how we fix that, okay? Um, we have Ataku Moses says, I got my first job as a front-end developer at my college after taking your tutorials. Thanks a lot, Sunny. Keep up the good work. That's what I'm talking about. Amazing, amazing stuff, dude. Job, Jay, screenshot that. That's sick, man. Thank you for sharing that with us. That's the Papa Fam energy right here. That's it. We just, we just, it's all about results for our students, right? So we've got the form dialed in. The, the reason why that background is there is because we need to style out the input. First thing I want to do, you see how it's not taking up the full width? We need to say flex one. This means that this input form, which is inside of our flex box container over here, so you see the form is surrounding the input form. What we essentially do is by making the input flex one, you're saying that input should be selfish. Take up all the room. So you see, bam, it takes up all the room. Then what we can do is say outline none. Right now, if I, before I save the file, you see I get this nasty blue 
outline. I hate that. I don't like it. It doesn't look good. So I'm going to do outline none. Now you can see I no longer get the outline. Okay. After that, we can go ahead and proceed with a background of transparent. Now you can see it blends in with the previous background, which looks a lot nicer than I, I think. Yeah. Then we're going to change the text into an indigo of 400. And I'm going to make the placeholder text slightly lighter shade of indigo 300. Okay, so now you can see very subtle design hints, but as you can see now, the placeholder is there in a subtle indigo. And then I can go ahead and type in something like MacBook Pro. And eventually, if I hit enter, you can see how it refreshes the page. That's not ideally what we want, right? We don't want it to refresh the page. We want to handle the submit function ourselves. So, how do we go about doing that, right? Well, we go to the form and we simply add in the on submit function and here i'm going to create a function called handle search okay and this function i'm going to go ahead and populate it up the top so i'm going to say const handle search i always get the question what is that autocomplete that is actually called auto uh, autopilot so we created an arrow function and here typescript complains it says you've got an e you're basically saying it's at any type because you haven't defined the type now what you can do here is a little trick you can go ahead and add a little arrow call here and if you hover over this it gives you the type for the submit function inside of that element so this is a really nice little hack that i teach all my students and then you can then do is import this by going down there and simply popping it in so control spacebar at the end of this then what you do is you get rid of that signature and bam now i have the perfect type definition incredible trick right and now I can do things like e dot prevent uh, e dot prevent default that prevents the page from refreshing. So now, ah, here's the next issue. So you can see as I've added in a event handler, for example, something like on submit. When we are using Next.js 13, so when I when I mean this is when we're using anything inside of the new app directory, which actually includes the components directory as well, right? If we go ahead and build a component. By default now, when we're using Next.js 13, including the app directory, the components will be considered as server components. This means that they're rendered on the server, which means there is no window to actually mount things like interactive or click handlers too. So in this case, an on submit function or any piece of state or anything like that is actually not going to work, right? So what we have to do is we have to take our header and we have to say, you have to be a client component and client components are able to go ahead. And they're the ones that we're basically saying, you need to now load on this, the actual browser. So you're not going to get preloaded on the server, which means, yes, you're not going to get that super fast page load just for that component, by the way. It's only going to be for that component. Yeah. So the rest of the page will load in a server fa fashion. But just for that one component, we're going to say you need to load on the browser. And that allows us to have a window that we can then go ahead and attach state. We can attach, you know, click handlers to and that sort of thing. So the, the way we do this is we go to the top and we simply say use a client now if we refresh the page you see we don't get an error anymore so the rest of the page was server rendered and this was loaded on the browser so the client and that's so powerful guys that really is so powerful okay um because you're now getting this seamless integration between client and server components Okay, so now we can go ahead and do things like the on submit. And I highly recommend that you don't just throw that around willy nilly. You make sure that you only add that in when needed. Okay, so don't throw that in every single where, place you go. I promise you, you're going to end up defeating the purpose of using this shares. You want it to be efficient. You want it to be super neat. Okay. So at this point now, if I go ahead and type in something like MacBook Pro and I hit enter, you shouldn't see the page refresh. Good. Okay. So now what I need is a reference to this input. So that way I can see what the user typed in. So I'm going to go ahead and get something called a ref. So I'm going to call it an input ref and we're going to use the use a ref hook from React. Okay. And the way that I can do this now is I basically firstly going to initialize it with a value of no. And the type of this reference is going to be known as an HTML input element. All right. So I like to be type specific to make sure that we, you know, we're not going to throw ourselves any errors. So I go ahead and I grab this input ref and I attach it and think of this as something like a pointer, right? So think of it as a big pointer and it's just now pointing towards my input field. So whenever I need the value from it, I can go to that pointer and I can say, give me your current value. That's all that I need to do, right? So it's actually really simple when we break it down like that. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to store that in a value. So I'm going to say const input equals input ref current value. Current is the current thing that you're actually pointing at. It's the reason we're using optional chaining is because it could be undefined, right? In case, you know, anything happened, it wasn't correctly mounted or anything like that. Then we're going to get the value. 
then what I want to do is I'm going to go ahead and say if there was actually no input simply return like don't do anything at this point if there was no input okay if there was an input then what I wanted you to do is I want to go ahead and clear the field now bear in mind what I've done here is I've copied the value into another variable and then I want to for the UI purposes I want to actually go ahead and get rid of this value right so what I'm actually doing here is remember this is going to get stored in here so afterwards essentially what you can do is you can go ahead and say if there is a uh, value here right then we're going to go ahead and clear that value to empty but we've still got the value stored that was initially there that way when i hit enter it just disappears right otherwise what you can have is sometimes a user might think they haven't submitted something and that, that's going to cause something that we didn't want because they might submit the same thing like five times thinking it hasn't worked okay then what we're going to do is do a try catch block Okay, try catch. Now here, eventually we're gonna have a call to activate the scraper. So we're gonna say call our API to activate the scraper. Okay, and then uh, on the catch block, we're gonna say handle any errors. Okay, so eventually we're gonna implement that. Cool, so that's done. And then eventually, even after that, we're gonna simply go ahead and wait for a response, right? So we're gonna say, wait for the response to come back okay done so that's going to be that pause for a second okay so we're going to go ahead and pause it there now what we essentially need to do is basically create our api endpoint so over here what i'm going to have is essentially an api endpoint like forward slash api forward slash activate scraper okay something along the lines of this now how the hell do we go ahead and create something like that well we can do it a few ways um we can actually do it with the pages component so the traditional api or we can do the new approach what i'm going to show you is a mix of the two okay so firstly i'm going to show you the traditional route and then if we get time at the end i'm actually going to translate it to the new way of doing it because i truly believe that it's still worth knowing how to do things the next year's 12 way because a lot of the code bases that you touch will be next year's 12 and then it's also really beneficial to know the new way of how to do things like the Next.js 13 approach, which is a lot cleaner in my opinion, and it uses the new root.ts file uh, structure, okay? So let's go ahead and get that down in. 400 likes passed, oh my God, that's crazy. Let's keep going strong, guys. We're gonna pass 500 likes. I know it, we're gonna keep this video banging and booming, it's gonna go past a thousand. That's, that's why I love you guys, okay? So now what we're gonna do is go to our pages API, and right now we've actually got an API endpoint available at forward slash api forward slash hello so now you can see name john doe and if i go into that for uh, hello.ts file you can see we have this right here now the issue with this approach is you can't actually tell what type of the request was so typically what you would have found is you would have had to say like if the rec method is not a get or if it's a get or if it's a post it just becomes a bit of a headache i'll be honest with you it becomes a bit annoying to, to, to do it to do that way right you kind of want to do it in a way that's going to be clean. It's going to be, you know, concise, that kind of thing. So this is where Next.js 13.2 came into play, whereby right now we could put, we could actually send like a get, post, put, delete, anything to this route and it would just work. I kind of want to show you a way that we can do it the new way with the, with the root, right? So in this case, we're going to have inside of our app folder, I'm going to have a forward slash. So in this case, I'm doing the new routing uh, directory. I'm going to say something like activate scraper. And I'm going to show you right now how I would go ahead and recommend that you read the blog post for 13.2 for next year, then apply that new logic and stuff like that. And I'm actually doing this live. So I'm actually showing you live. The demo that I prepared has the old way, but I think it's going to be super beneficial for you to learn the new way. So I'm going to show you literally live on a stream right now. Uh, yeah. So if it goes wrong, that's cool. We can learn together. Activate scraper. We're going to go ahead and say root ts this is a reserved file name for the new api structure okay so what i can do is i can type in next.js 13.2 and there's a beautiful blog post over here and it's got a really nice little snippet of code that i want to showcase to you we've got the new metadata we've got the, the dynamic metadata and we've also got the custom root handlers so this is the one that i was looking for and what you can actually do here is you can export a bunch of different things you can export a get you can export a post you can export a delete and these are all the standards for the current rest api that is, exists right so in this case we're only caring about a post function so i'm going to go ahead and put a post in like so 
cool now with that in place what we're going to do is basically go ahead and implement our um our um request okay so no different tower I typically would have done it here except we're going to go ahead and i just want to prove to your point that if we did go ahead and say something like get right here get and i went ahead and said uh, let me just double check a example a response um so if we had here for example a response you can see return a new response 200 and i just want to prove to you a point of how this works right so if i was to return a new response let's just ignore that for now it just says hello uh, let's just say hello papa fam so you know it's me hello papa fam and you guys are really gonna like this i promise you right so if we now if we go over to our local host localhost 3000 forward slash activate scraper and because i'm doing a get request what we should see is hello papa fam hey look at that guys incredible right just from this new sleek syntax so this is nextjs 13.2 cutting edge brand new stuff that's what we do here right we learn the best the newest stuff okay so that's how i recommend you now do your stuff your roots and it also seamlessly has an integration with the existing app directory so you have this nice seamless integration with your edge runtime and your node.js runtime and yeah everything just works like it is cool i like it right so at this point let's go ahead and build out our api endpoint okay so um we're gonna go ahead and pull so imagine when i actually create this uh post request what i'm gonna do is i'm gonna go ahead and get the uh, i'm gonna pass something like the search in the body right so here what i want to do is imagine when i've actually typed in uh, a search term like here so i'm gonna type in like macbook pro okay i'm actually gonna send this off as a search uh, as, as as part of the request of body okay so here what i'll do is i'll say something like this i'll say const search equals rec.body.search okay and in this case why is it freaking out let's have a look uh rec.body is possibly no okay so let's go ahead and say this rec.body search uh so i think i need to actually give it a special type definition oh okay so this is where i haven't actually okay this is where it gets a little bit tricky because i haven't actually prepared this one uh and i haven't done this uh, example before with the new structure so that's going to be a bit interesting does not exist on type request okay so rather than doing this live <laughs> which i don't want to do right now uh, we could okay you know what, screw it let's try it next js 13.2 i'm actually doing this live and figuring out i haven't done the post function before with the new folder um the new api but i want to show you because i kind of want to get it done so request how can i get the type definition changed here that's the that's the wrong one sorry um it's gonna be for I believe here no yeah post here we are request optional here we are context params we can see it gets passed in but for the post i do want to see if i can actually get the item next request blah 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 i actually wanted the um gives you further control okay so what we i think what we can do maybe is extend this so we could maybe define a type so we could say something like uh request and body and i can actually pass in something like the search okay and i can say request and body something like that is that gonna work if i do request body search no that's not gonna work okay okay so i am debating if we're gonna do this mm, this is uh this is tricky i'm doing this i'm trying to figure it out live so i don't know if i want to spend too long doing this should i do it or should i not mm. Where's the TypeScript definition for this? This is a proper live right now. Next request, use const body erect with. Okay, so someone just gave me it there. So use next request. So next request. And then. That's not the one that I want, though, I believe. <clears throat> so next API request, I believe, is the one that I need. Next API request. I don't know if that's going to work, though. But we can try it. Let's try that, right? So next API request, next body search. Okay, let's give that a go, right? So I'm going to go ahead and basically this is actually coming from the previous type definition. So next API request, next API response. Okay, so let's go ahead and give that a try. Um, and hopefully it works. Okay, no promises. I'm hoping it works as just as much as you guys. Okay, so we've got that in 
And then what I need to do is make a request somewhere else, right? So I need to go ahead and make, this is when I will eventually make a call to Bright Data to start the scraping functionality. Okay, so what I now wanna do is basically go ahead and set up my Bright Data. So on the second link in the description, no, so the first link in the description, sorry, you'll find a link for Bright Data. So I want you to go ahead and click it. It says, get started for free with $15 credit using Bright Data. That will take you to the following page. You'll get to this page and it will go ahead and prompt you. Now you can go ahead and sign up. And if it's just you by yourself, you can go ahead and just hit one to nine. Or you can sign up with Google. Signing up with Google is super quick and easy. Once you've done that, okay, then we can go ahead and someone says need the away. Yes, I will add that in, don't worry. Okay, so once we've gone ahead and done that, we can go ahead and head over to our dashboard. So you'll find yourself at the sort of starting screen. Head over to the left side and click on data sets and web scraper IDE. Then you're gonna click on my scrapers, okay? Now what I've done is you need to go ahead and create the Amazon sort of scraper that I've got right here. But I've actually gone ahead and helped you do this. So we're gonna go ahead and click on developer web scraper. And then what I want you to do is in the third link in the description, I've actually included a GitHub link, okay? So here you've got a bunch of different things. You've got Amazon product page, blah, blah, blah. In this case, we're gonna click on start from scratch. You can actually go ahead and use any of these templates if you'd like. I'm gonna start from scratch to begin with, okay? Then I want you to click on the third link in the description. The third link in the description will take you to this. And as you can see, what I've done here is I've included a bunch of different steps and a bunch of different guidelines for you so that you can actually see how to get your uh, end result looking. So typically what it has is we're basically building the automation steps. So this is how we go ahead and program the scraper on how to go ahead and scrape and do what it needs to do. And I also recommend you firstly head over to this at the top here, the code settings, and click on code, okay? So here you can see browser or code. Browser essentially means that you're literally gonna mimic a browser going onto the uh, website, but that's not really fast. Code is when you essentially are doing it in a headless fashion. So in a headless format, you're gonna go to the page, scrape it and that kind of good stuff and then get the things off it, right? A lot of people are asking, what is Bright Data? Bright Data is an amazing scraper platform. It also has a bunch of other things, but essentially what we're using today is the scraping uh, section of it. And we're gonna be using this to go ahead and use it's a massive network of IPs and proxies to actually go ahead and scrape data off Amazon. So that way you don't go ahead and actually get caught. You can go ahead and do this uh, legit way, I guess, right? So in this case, I've got the code for you. So if we go to our GitHub repo, go to step one interaction code, simply copy this code. Okay, so copy this code and you can obviously customize it. What we're essentially doing here is going to amazon.com and we're simply entering in a search term, okay? So at this point, I'm just gonna pop this into my left side. I'm gonna pop this into my right side and we can now see. Okay, so where is my, um, where am I at? Where am I at, where am I at? Okay, here. Yeah, so what I want you to do is for the interaction code, you simply go to step one, interaction code, take it. For the parser code, you simply copy this right here and you pop it in the parser code, okay? And then you can go ahead and name your first step. So this one is gonna essentially be navigating to the page and going ahead and getting your search term, okay? Uh, but in this case, we're not too bothered about going past that. Well, then what I want you to do is, you can actually check out the readme as well. I've actually put in uh, steps and instructions, but we need an input parameter. So head down to input, click on add input parameter and type in search. Okay, this is gonna be a string and it's not gonna be a predefined value. It is gonna be required, however. So we're gonna click on save and now we have a search, okay? Then what I want you to do is go ahead and press on the, um, that's fine. Uh, we can predefine value, it's up to you. Okay, but that's fine for now. Then we're gonna click on add another step. The second step, we have step two interaction code. So I want you to simply co uh, copy this pop this inside of here and step two here. So think of it in a way that is very simple, right? So you can actually review this code if you want, but what it's essentially doing is step one is it's going to the Amazon page. So imagine step one is going to this page and landing here. Step two is it clicks into each product and it extracts the information from that page, okay? So that's essentially what we're doing here. But then we there are a few important factors here that we have to consider, right? So firstly, what I need you to do is on the second page, we have to define our inputs as well, okay? So each step has its own inputs. The second page has URL, search, and ID, okay? So in this case, what we're gonna do is we're gonna go to our second step, 
So a new stage here. I'm going to go down to our inputs. You can see we have fresh inputs here. So I want to go ahead and make the first one a URL. This is going to be a string. It is required, right? Then we're going to have a second input parameter, and this is going to be a search. And then we have a third, which is going to be the ID. Cool. Now we've got a URL, our search and our ID. Okay. And this is essentially where we're going to go ahead and add in, you know, our values and so forth. Right. So now what we can do is we can go ahead and click on finish editing. All right. So once you've done that, um, we can go ahead and finish editing. And right now, oh, sorry, my bad. It's already running the pre-save. Go ahead and close that. Um, ignore that for now. And as you can see, what it found was, oh, okay. So I went ahead and saved it. Right. So that's fine. So you should get to this page. Okay. So then I want you to go ahead and click on edit the code and I want you to just check something out before we carry on. So you can go ahead and actually test your code. You can click on, uh, press on the here to run it. And as you can see, it will go ahead and run. Uh, this was an undefined sort of test as you could see right there. So if we go ahead and click on new stage, let's go over here. I want to see if I had it correct. Go search. Let's just type in something like, um, let's actually go to save to development. Cause I haven't passed in the actual template, uh, template stuff right now. So that's probably my issue here. As you can see though, it's, it is pulling in the correct values. You see that? Cause obviously I'm passing in undefined, right? So, uh, we can just say set up our scraper. Obviously when we run this thing, we are going to pass in things like the search and all that good stuff. Okay. So now new collector, we're going to say Amazon web scraper. And I've essentially gone ahead and built out our scraper. Now, obviously that scraper, you can feel free to go modify that code, do whatever you want to do with it. But I'm actually just skipping that bit because I want you to kind of not focus too much on the scraping aspect if you don't know how to scrape websites, but you can feel free to inspect that code and look at it, right? And you can see update available is because we've gone ahead and updated that code. So you can click update, click on update your collector. Okay. Then you want to go ahead and click on integrate to your system. And this is what we want to get used to. We want to see this area. So initiate by API. So you can actually go ahead and use this right here with your API token, pass in a search term and it will trigger your, uh, your scraper. Okay. Or we can initiate it manually right here. So you can pass in a search yourself and you can actually go ahead and do it. So let's try a manual search right now. So we type in something like MacBook pro and let's click on start. Okay. And as you can see, what happens is it goes ahead and it starts your job. And what this will essentially do is it will input, it, you see, we're passed in one input. It will go to the pages and it will try to scrape the relevant information. And you can see here, we have a collector ID for this job where it starts to begin the collection process. So it found two pages and it's going to go ahead and scrape the records. Now, the way we set this up is it's not going to go through, you know, millions of different records in Amazon. I've actually limited it. So it's actually going to only pull in. For example, in this case, it pulled in 18 records. So if we were to go here and download the results, we can now go ahead and download our results. If I go ahead and click in, oops, oh God, that's going to open up Xcode. Oh no. <laughs> okay. So in this case, that's my bad. You can go ahead and click on download results. Um, oh, God damn it. Uh, okay. I'll show you how we do that afterwards. But essentially now what this has done is it scraped in all the information, right? Uh, so if we do a quick view, can I see? Yeah, there you go. Quick view. So sample data. Look at that, guys. So now you get the title, URL, sponsored, rating, reviews, price, previous price, and all this other good stuff. And now let me tell you, that's damn impressive, right? That's damn impressive. And the reason why that's so impressive is what was happening behind the scenes there is Bright Data took our sort of scraping code, but then it goes ahead and it essentially puts it on all of its IPs and proxies. And then those IPs and proxies, which consider it as IP is an IP address for a machine right so these machines go onto amazon basically execute the commands that we went ahead and put on there so they're going to go into amazon and actually start look, essentially acting as a user and scraping the information off of this right and then what it's going to do is it's going to return that information to us and we can use it however we want now the really really cool part about this is that right now obviously we can get the results by downloading it manually but typically i mean that doesn't make sense right how the hell am i supposed to do that on my website so here if i go to delivery preferences 
you can see that we now have a bunch of different delivery strategies. So API download means that we can actually go ahead and download the data afterwards. So we can actually go ahead and run this following command afterwards to download the data, right? But we can actually do something even better, right? We can use something called a webhook. So when finished, notify me by webhook. Okay, now the first step is I do want my delivery strategy to be, to, to be an API download and you can use webhook here as well, but I'm trying to show you a mix of things. So I'm going to do a delivery strategy as API download, but I want to be notified when the webhook finishes. Now I'm going to do a quick illustration, which actually explains the entire process. So I'm actually going to go to one of my favorite websites. I call it, I think it's called Yofla, right? And it's just a black screen. So let's go ahead and do that right now. So I'm on a black screen called Yofla. Let's go over here. And I'm going to quickly illustrate what the hell is happening, right? So imagine we've got our client and tell me and just smash the thumbs up button. Get me to 500 likes if this helps you out with these visual explanations, right? So we've got the client. The client is my Next.js app, okay? So this is where you've got all of your beautiful app and you do everything on it, right? Then we've got our server over this side. Now the server in this case, consider it as bright data, okay? So I'm going to draw a little server right here. So ignore my amazing drawing skills, but this is my server and this is a bright data okay so bright data is basically going to do the job of scraping now bright data can scrape from any website it can scrape from amazon it can scrape from walmart it can scrape from ebay it can scrape from anything you define okay so what we're doing is we're sending a request to bright data right so we're going to make an api call we haven't written this code yet but we're going to make an api call to bright data then what's going to happen is bright data is going to go ahead and scrape amazon it's going to get that data back Okay, but typically what we would sometimes do is we would have to wait for the response to come back. Now, when we wait for the response to come back, we have to stay on the page. The problem if we stay on the page is if I leave the page at any point, if I go away, you know, and I kind of like there's so many things that can go wrong at that point, And then I just won't get the results back. Right. And then it's kind of broken the flow. But what if I told you there was a way that we can actually go ahead and bypass this? So you could send like 50 requests, Bright Data will go ahead and do the work that it needs to do, but then it will go to something called a webhook, right? So I'm going to visualize it in this way. So that way, hopefully it will make a little bit more sense. And yes, this may not be the exact way it happens, but this is the way I like to teach students because it's just easy to understand, right? So think of a webhook as like a messenger. So now what we're doing is when Bright Data finishes, Bright Data will send the completion. So imagine Bright Data sends a completed event to uh, our webhook, right? Uh, to a specific webhook. Now this webhook, we can attach a URL to it. So we can say, you know, once that's done, I want you to go to, you know, my website. So my site.com forward slash activate scraper, or it could be, you know, forward slash completed, right? So completed um, scrape, right? Scraper or something like that, right? Whatever you want, you can go ahead and deploy this, right? So now what's going to happen is when bright data is finished, it sends completed with a bunch of information attached to it. So it's going to have loads of different data attached to it, right? So imagine it scrapes, it gets the data from Amazon. The data gets passed it along with a completed event. So now it hits this URL and then we can do anything we want with that information, right? So at this point, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this, just move that to the side and I'm going to push this into a fire, Firebase database. Right, so I'm going to make this a little bit smaller. I'm just going to pop it here, for example, pop it into a Firebase database, right? So imagine if I pop in the Firebase database. So now what I'm doing is you have your completed scraper and then the webhook is just going to go bam. It's going to throw the data into Firebase. So you see, even if the client disappears, the data always goes into Firebase because the webhook or this, this URL here is going to be the one that we, we're basically going to deploy this as a cloud function. So that's always live. That's always going to be live, right? So once that's always live, we don't have to care if the client was still there or not. It's still going to go ahead and wait for the information to come back and then push it to Firebase. And then here's, here's, the, here's the, like the, the creme de la creme. Here's the, here's the amazing part that I love so much, right? So once it's in Firebase, what we can do is Firebase has a Firestore real-time database connection. So the client can subscribe in a sort of a subscriber fashion. So we're going to create a real-time connection to this Firebase database. So I'm going to do it in like an arrow like that. Okay, I don't know if that makes sense, right? Is that, let me let me kind of make that a little bit neater. Right, so imagine we've got this kind of real-time connection between our client and Firebase. And now you see what happens, right? We can send like 50 different requests 
too bright data. It doesn't matter, right? These are going to be post requests that we're going to send, right? So 50 different post requests go to bright data. Bright data starts scraping all these different websites, doing everything that we need. The completed data just fires off every time that Amazon finish, uh, every time bright data finishes its job, it hits the webhook that is over here that we're going to go ahead and deploy on a cloud function, right? So we're going to have a separate app, which is just going to be the cloud function. So I'm going to teach you how to do that. And then it's just going to populate our Firebase database every single time it finishes. Our client will then listen to it real time and bam, just like that, your client is getting real time information and you have a architecture here, which, is, which isn't kind of like constrained to the client staying there. The client can go ahead, send 50 requests, go off his phone, head off somewhere else, come back and then all the data will be there when it's ready, it's finished, right? So this is kind of a cool way of doing it, right? I hope this explanation helps you out. If it did, just destroy that like button and get us past 500 likes, right? We're literally so close. And if you want more of these kind of illustrations, let me know, I'm happy to do them, okay? So without further ado, let's add in a URL. And if you want to secure your webhook, so that way not anybody can just kind of ping the hell out of it, you can actually add in authorization headers. And that could be a secret key, for example, that only you and the cloud function know. And then you can kind of do, you know, you can check based on that. So at this point, we need to go ahead and develop our cloud function. So I want to develop this part of it, right? The, the my site area. Of it. I want to build this part. And this is going to be a Firebase cloud function. So you can see clearly here, Firebase is coming in clutch. So Firebase cloud function. Okay, so this is going to be a Firebase Cloud function. So I'm going to show you how to build a Firebase Cloud function, deploy this, so that way we have our, you know, our API endpoint. And I'm even going to show you how we can ngrok and tunnel this, so that way we can kind of develop on it, use it as a test of a, like kind of environment, and then move forward with it. Okay, so let's do it right now. So we're going to go to our firebase.google.com, and we're going to create our Cloud function. Okay, so remember, this can be a little bit overwhelming, especially if you're starting out. Don't worry, right? Remember, you can join Zero to Full Stack Hero if you want to learn all of this stuff. We just actually covered this inside of a the recent coaching call. Um, but yeah, I try my best to break it down as much as I can on the streams, but I hope you appreciate and enjoy that. Okay, so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a new Bright Data project. And you can do this on the CLI if you want to as well, but I'm going to show you this way, right? So we're going to say Bright Data, and I'm going to say YouTube Build. Okay, uh, I've actually added a little space there. We're going to get rid of that. Continue. I'm going to disable Google Analytics. This will create my project. And this is going to serve two purposes, Firebase right here. We're going to have the Firestore real-time database. This is going to hold all the information from the scraper results from Bright Data. And it's going to do an amazing job of going ahead, scraping Amazon, just like I showed you right now. It's going to pull that information. Once the webhook fires off, it's going to hit our cloud function, which we deploy using Google uh, Firebase cloud functions. That will then populate our database using the Firebase admin SDK. Sounds like what the hell, but it's going to work. All right, I promise you. All right, so we're going to click on continue. Now, first things first, let's go over to build and we're going to head over to cloud functions. So functions is right here. Now, in order to activate cloud functions, you have to go ahead and enable your plan on the Blaze plan. So you see it says upgrade your project's billing plan, but please understand there is a huge free tier here, okay? So there is a free tier. So don't stress and, oh my God, I got to pay now. You don't have to pay. You just have to add in like a billing account detail. So that's all you have to do here, which is pretty standard for a lot of these things, okay? So go ahead and click on our, our upgrade project. And then I've already got a billing account. So I'm going to click on OK. And this will continue my account. And you can actually set a budget amount. So imagine you didn't want to spend more than a pound. Or in this case, that you'll get an email at 50p, 90p. So I always get the question of, you know, oh my God, it's going to cost me millions. Like, chill out, it won't. Right? So I'm going to say, you know, when it hits um, 10 pounds budget amount, okay? Obviously, I'm not going to hit that. But I just don't want it to crash on the stream for whatever reason. So I'm going to click on purchase. There we go. And now that will have a limit. So there you go, page go, blaze plan. There you go. And then we're gonna go to get started. And as you can see, you need to install the Firebase tools globally, right? So I've already done this. I don't need to do that. But you can you can run that command inside of your um, <coughs> you're gonna run that command inside of your terminal. Next thing, we have to initialize a Firebase project and deploy it. Now I'm gonna show you a way to do this in a in, in a good way, right? So. Uh, <laughs> Patty, I, I see that Udemy would be mad how <laughs> Udemy would be mad now because here's the world's best tutorial. Then Gwen goes, I heard a rumor they're closing business because Sunny took the entire market. I love that. <laughs> I appreciate you guys. Um, so at this point, 
what I'm going to do is I'm going to open up my terminal and I want to make this extremely clear. We're going to create essentially two apps, right? So you can merge the two things. So even in the Papa GitHub repo, there's going to be two apps. There's going to be the front end, which is the Next.js app, which is the Next.js 13.2 app, which is going to be the whole UI, all that good stuff. And then we've got the back end, which is essentially going to be the Firebase Cloud functions. And I'm going to show you how to go ahead and say up. There's two reasons why you might want to do this. One, when you're maintaining your code and your project and all that good stuff, it's, it's kind of nice to have two separate repos, right? You can actually work and maintain them separately, have your separate source control, all that good stuff. Two, it also allows you to not mess up your TS configs, right? So sometimes your TS config, especially as you get bigger, bigger, bigger projects, you might want to have certain rules in your cloud functions that you don't want to have in your Next.js uh, app and all this kind of stuff. And sometimes it can cause a bit of issue. So I want to make your life easy. So create a separate one just for now, okay? If you want to go ahead and do it. So we don't have Redux in this build. Someone's asking Redux. Um, so let's go ahead and do documents builds okay and then i'm going to go ahead and say make directory so all i'm doing by writing my make directory is literally creating a folder okay and then i'm going to say bright data youtube build backend okay and now i'm going to go into that exact directory so i'm going to copy that and say cd into that directory and now i do code dot okay so i want to make this again extremely clear i have two apps i have my Next.js app on the right, right? So this is my Next.js app that we were messing with before. And then I have the new Firebase app, right? And as you can see, it's just empty. It's completely empty, okay? So let's go ahead and do Command-J to open up my terminal. Now, my terminal is inside of, uh, inside the correct directory. So at this point, what I need you to do is firstly, I'm going to type in git init. Git init is going to basically create a git branch for me inside of it. So that way I can eventually push this to GitHub, do all that good stuff, okay? That's the first part. Second part is I've already installed the Firebase CLI tools. So you would have to type in Firebase login. I've already done this step. So I'm just going to type in Firebase init, right? So once this is down, this will pop up the beautiful Firebase CLI. And it's actually a really awesome CLI. I do love how they've done it. It makes it super easy to go ahead and get things set up. And guys, we are 10 likes away from 500. Just do me a favor and just blow that like button up so damn hard that it just flies past 500 to 1,000 straight away. All right, just do that for the channel. Allow this video to grow and I will really appreciate it, okay? So now that that's done, we're going to go down on the arrow keys and you can see here we can set up a bunch of different things. So here I'm just going to go into functions, hit spacebar, and I'm going to just enable functions only, okay? Now, Charles Crook says, let's go, Sonny. That's what I'm talking about. Rowan says, 500 nearby. Hey, 500. That's what I'm talking about. That's sick. All right. I'm going to change the music up a little bit as well. That's so cool, guys. Thank you for a massive amount of support. Let's get to 1,000. I think we can do it. I think we can do it. All right. So at this point, you want to go ahead and click on use an existing project. Okay. So I'm going to go ahead and click on use an existing project. And then you can see here, I've got a bunch of different builds. Now I'm super confused because I'm not sure which one I just created. So what you want to do is here, bright data, YouTube build. So that's my one that I'm doing now. Bright data, YouTube build is the second one. Click on that. All right. And then you can see function set. So which language would you like to deploy in? I'm going to say TypeScript, All right? Do you, learn, do you want to use ESN? So you can use ESN. Just for this tutorial, I'm going to say no because I don't want it to bother me, bug me, and that kind of stuff. Do you want to install dependencies with NPM now? Yes, I do. Okay, so I, it's going to use NPM to go ahead and do this, I believe. Okay. A quick little water break while it does that, but you guys have been incredible so far. Keep it going. We've got front end, back end, all this good stuff. Rico says, looking fresh as hell, boy. That's what I'm talking about. See how I censored it? <laughs> All right. Christian says, hello, Sonny. What's up? I appreciate you, dude, for tuning in. So there we go. You see that, right? So now what I want you to do is Command B, and you should see your folder directory, okay? So Command J to hide the terminal. And I want you to look at your new folder structure for your backend. So you've got functions, and now you've got your source folder. You've got your index.ts, and then you've got a bunch of examples here. So I'm going to go ahead and just uncomment all of this for now. And as you can see, we've got start writing functions. We've got some examples right here. And we've got, you know, an example of a hello world right here as well, okay? So what I want you to do is I'm just going to get my stuff on the screen so you can, uh, can get things ready. Is that we're going to go ahead and create a, you know, like what I talked about before. So now we're creating this webhook that we're eventually going to hit, okay? So once Bright Data finishes, we're eventually it's going to push it to this webhook. So... I'm going to change this to be called on scraper complete. Yeah. 
And then that's going to be the name of the webhook. So it's going to be like a URL forward slash on scraper complete. And then we're going to do functions, HTTPS, on request, request response. And now over here, we can go ahead and just say, like, we can test this out, right? So I just want to run this just to see if it works. So we're going to do command J. And then what I want you to do is, if you ever don't know what the command is to run it, all you got to do is explorer package.json, command J to hide that, command B to hide that. And then you can see you've got all your scripts. You can do like npm run uh, run build, npm run serve, npm run show, npm run start, all that good stuff. I'm just going to go ahead and do uh, yarn. Wait, is it yarn or npm? Okay, package lock. So npm, npm run serve, right? And as you can, oh, okay. So this again, you're going to run into this as well, right? It always happens with me. You have to cd into the functions directory, okay? So cd into the functions directory. And now you can do your npm run serve, right? And what this will do is it will run npm run build and Firebase emulator start only functions. So basically what that's doing is, it's going ahead and starting the emulator suite for Firebase, but it's only starting the functions emulators, right? Which is what we want for now. <clears throat> so in this case, you can see using node 16. So before we carry on, I wanna do something to prevent a bunch of issues later on, which trust me, will end up killing you, annoying you. So I wanna cancel this, so control C, and then I'm gonna go command B, package JSON, command B to hide, node 18, okay? And at this point, I'm changing my node version to 18. But what we have to make sure is that we're actually running the correct node version. So if you type in node dash dash version, Right. You'll see I'm on 16.8.1 right now. Now, I highly recommend you download something called NVM. NVM is a node version manager. I'm not going to go too far into installing this, but it's a, re it's a really good, um, awesome way. All you need to do is copy this into your terminal and you can go ahead and install NVM. But it's an amazing way to actually switch between versions of Node. And it's actually something you'll really need in your production environments when you're working, right? So I recommend you get that installed. So if I type in NVM LS, NVM LS tells me what's on my system and what version I'm currently on. So it tells me I'm on version 16, but I'm actually building this in Node 18. So what I need to do is type in NVM use 18. Right? And if you don't have it, you just type in NVM install 18. Now what it's gonna do is it's gonna switch my node version to node version 18. So now if I type in node dash dash version, you can see I'm now on node version 18. And it's worth mentioning that if you close this and come back, you're gonna have to make sure you switch your node version again, right? There is a way to set the default, but I'm not gonna change it for now. You see the default right now is 16, okay? But in this case, if I do NVM LS, you will now see that we are now on 18. Okay, so now that we've switched our node version, we can go back and we can type in npm run serve. So you've got some production little tips and tricks going on here, right? If you're really finding this helpful, again, watch and make sure you smash that thumbs up button. Subscribe if you haven't already. MVM is a real treat. It's something that you should be using in your uh, developer journey. Okay, <clears throat> so at this point, you can see we have our little uh, URL here that's given to us, okay? So HTTP function is initialized. Let's go to that URL, and what we should see is we get a nice little hello from Firebase message. And that's actually our endpoint, which we've programmed over here. So command J, hide the terminal. You can see hello from Firebase. So it's working. This is great, right? Now, question. What I want to do is I essentially want to have this running so I can develop on it, but I want to be able to actually have my local host, which is the URL that I just saw, hello from Firebase. I want to port that and essentially tunnel that onto the internet. So that way when I'm developing and testing the webhook, I can actually go ahead and use my local host to develop my solution. And then only when it's ready, I can deploy and then I can use that as the main webhook URL. So a lot of the time what you would have found is, you know, you'll see like, oh, put your webhook here. Then you're probably wondering, I have to keep deploying so I can update my webhook, which is kind of annoying, right? I'm going to show you a way around that, right? And it's actually a really cool little hack. Not really a hack, but it's just something that like a lot of devs do in the in the production environment. Okay, so we're going to split the terminal. So on my left hand side, I've got my functions running, and we're going to use something called ngrok. Okay, so ngrok is an awesome tunneling sort of uh, tool. So if we type in ngrok, I'm going to show you it right now. So it's called online in one line. This is, this is a little tagline, and essentially what you're doing here is you're basically going ahead and um, where is it? Now I want to show you the actual main screen for it <coughs> uh okay they actually did just change this but it was a nicer way of putting it in 
What is it? Oh, no, 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 no. Okay, anyway, screw that. Don't worry about it. But basically, what you want to do is head over to the download. So go to ngrok forward slash download install it. I've installed it with Homebrew. You can install it with, with a bunch of whatever approach you want, install it. Okay. Once it's done, all you need to do is start something called a tunnel. And what you want to do is you want to forward a certain port on your machine. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and forward the following port. So if we look over here, you can see the emulator is running on the host port 127001 So that's the port that I'm going to start forwarding, right? That's the host port. So what I can do is I can go here, I type in ngrok HTTP. Basically, I'm saying forward the HTTP 5001 port. Hit enter. Okay, now I've got an account, so I've actually logged in and I pasted in my uh, key. Again, when you install it and set up all that good stuff, make sure you check it out. Um, <laughs> I see that. That's nice. Um, so at this point, we're going to go ahead and um, you see I've got a forwarding URL here. So this one right here is the one that I want you to pay attention to. So copy this and just simply pop that over here and then do forward slash. And here you can see on scraper complete. So I'm basically, this is now a fully functional forwarded URL. Okay, so if I go ahead and head over to that now on the internet. So, okay, so my, uh, I have an antivirus. It actually, it freaks out and I'm not gonna lie. It does that quite a lot, which is a bit annoying. So I'm just gonna go ahead and uh, sort this out for a second uh, on my machine. So that way it fixes it out. Give me one second, guys. Super annoying. Well, why does this have to happen when I'm live, right? There we go. Uh, so I'm going to go on to my, it's happened on the coaching call as well. Okay, cool. So at this point now, we're going to go here and we're going to click on visit site. And as you can see, it says oh, not found. Okay. So that's not ideal, right? That's not actually exactly what we wanted. Um, but that's how you would essentially go ahead and set this. Oh, sorry. My bad. So we actually wanted it here. You want to grab the rest of this. I actually didn't even get the most of it. So we want that bright data build US central, right? So this is the one that you actually wanted. Okay, so there you can see hello from Firebase. That's what I wanted, all right? So you need to go ahead and get all of this stuff, all right? So the rest of the URL is what you need. So now we've got a live URL, a link, and make sure you know that can sometimes expire if you haven't got an account. So make sure you don't go ahead and mess that up too much. But now what we can do is we can take this, we can go over to Bright Data. So I can simply go to Bright Data. I need to close that, that's Xcode. We're not using Xcode, not today. Uh, and then we're going to go over here and now here's my Amazon web scraper on bright data and where we had the webhook, I'm simply going to go ahead and pop it in there. Okay. And as you can see, my URL is there now I need the full URL. Okay. So I'm going to go ahead and take the full URL that we, we just talked about. So I'm going to go here, copy the full URL, paste it in here. And what's so good about this guys is every time you start in Grok, by the way, you get a new URL. So just remember that. Okay. So you're going to have to update this if you change it. But now what I can do is I can develop on this and actually test this out to see if it works. Right. Which is really powerful. So now what I can do is if I go ahead and uh, sort of log this out and I'm just going to move this to the side. So Ngrok is running in that little gap. If I go ahead and type in test webhook, you see how it sent a message to my, my server. So look at this. If I go ahead and type, type test web book, nice. Look at that, guys. It actually works, right? So let's go ahead and let's go ahead and click update. So a lot of you are saying it's insecure, blah, blah, blah. So that doesn't matter right now because when we deploy it, it will actually go ahead and be, um, when we actually deploy this, it will be a HTTPS uh, URL, right? And even right now is HTTP tunnel, uh, is HTTPS tunnel, right? Someone says, why antivirus? Antivirus is just, you know, it helps out. Okay, so we're going to click update. So now this is going ahead and set up. Okay, so what I want to now do is obviously you should be using authorization has this is a demo. So I'm going to go ahead and do this. And also something I want to mention, this is so handy because if you're trying to demo an app to a client, for example, you can simply tunnel your local host 3000, for example, show them the, the, the app over a Zoom call or something. And then when you're finished, you just cut the terminal and that's it, right? You pretty much, uh, you, you only show the demo for the period as opposed to just deploying the entire thing. Okay, so at this point, we're going to pick up the speed because we've got a lot of work to do. Okay, so what I want to do is I'm going to add in a little bit of a test sort of situation. I'm going to type in console log, say scrape complete, right? Request body, and then I'm going to go ahead and just pop in this. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to cut my server, npm run serve again. And as you can see here, 
You can add a little listener in the background. My NGROC does not need to change because all it's going to do is keep on forwarding the same port. So you don't need to keep changing it. You just need to go, I'm just rerunning this, right? Yes, you should be actually setting up a listener and then it kind of changes, but anyway. Okay, so at this point now, we've got the scraper complete. And what I can do is we should see here, value command K to clear that terminal. If I click, click on send webhook, we should see scrape complete in a short second, right? So scrape complete. And as you can see now, it's given me a bunch of information from that completion, okay? So as you can see now, we've got the success, the ID, which is a test, and it's given us a collector ID. And this is an example of, remember when we done that collector in the beginning, we actually went ahead and had got something similar to this, right? It was something like a collector ID. So now we've got our webhook fully functional, okay? So with this in place, we actually do get more information than that, or actually, to be honest, we all, this is all we kind of care about, right? So with this bit done now, what I want to do is I need to now go ahead and pause this process, head over to my Firebase, and now we're going to set up our database, right? Because what I'm going to need to do is actually have a database that I can now store some information into it. Here's the flow. Client is going to make a request to our own API, and then that's going to go ahead and tell uh Bright data to start scraping the website. That's going to then push a piece of information into Firestore saying scraping has begun, right? And it's going to put a status of pending. Now, when it's pending in the pending state, that's when we're going to see the loader. That's when we're going to see, you know, all of the loading situation like you can see over here. So that's when we're going to have all of this information like so. So when it's in the pending state, you're going to see this. Then once it's completed, it's going to stream the data into your Firestore database, at which point your client is always going to be listening to that information, okay? So all of this good stuff to come, we have a lot to work on, right? So head over to build, go to your Firestore database, and then we're going to initialize our database, right? So let's go ahead and do this. How do you make the VS Code tabs bigger? Command plus and command minus to make your font bigger and smaller. That's what I'm doing. And I use the pinch and move in to zoom in and out, right? We're almost at 600 likes. Let's go, guys. Absolutely killing it. Amazing stuff. So go to start in test mode just for this demo, okay? Just for this demo, I'm doing that. Obviously, if you're live, you should set security rules. Then we're going to click on enable, okay? Now, at this point, this will set up our cloud Firestore database. Now, once this is done, I need something called the admin SDK, right? And basically, what this allows us to do is from a server-side perspective, as an admin, because it's only us have access to the server side, which in a controlled environment is true, then what we want to do is basically make changes to the database from the server side. But there's a way that we have to essentially do that. So we have to go over to our settings, project settings. And what I want you to do is firstly, we are going to go to our service accounts. Okay, now inside of service accounts, we're going to click on create service account. Now, once you've done that, you should see this, right? So this is where we are going to get our service account snippets. So we're not going to use this exact bit of code, but the main thing here is generate a new private key. And I want you to click on generate key. What this will do is it will download a large file onto our machine for us. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to open up that file. I just don't want it to pop up on the screen right now. And that's simply, basically, that JSON that got downloaded, I want you to hold on to that for a second, okay? So hold on to that file and keep that in the side for a second. Now, what I want you to do next is I want you to go over to your, um, <coughs> I want you to basically, where you had that file, I want you to drag it into your, um, your, your code over here, right? So I essentially want you to pull that into your source folder like so, right? So this is the what we essentially got. And I'm going to simply rename this long, you know, horrible file to the service account key, service account key dot JSON. Okay. Service account key dot JSON. So we're just going to copy that there. All right. Now, once you've got this down, what I want you to do is simply create a, inside of your source folder, create another file called Firebase Admin. Firebase admin .ts, okay? Now inside of here, what I'm actually gonna do is I need to install a dependency. So I'm gonna pull open another terminal separately. So this is another separate terminal. The other two are running in split screen, but I wanna kind of keep it fresh on the screen. Whoa, Ben Carter. There we go. Member for 10 months, Ben Carter. That, yo, ben, that's sick. Nice to see you again, dude. You're sick, bro. That's awesome, man. 
Uh, I appreciate you being here again. Ibrahim says, I just want to say, I finished your chat GPT. You're smashing good with the content. I'm grateful for the, for, for the Pop Fam. That's awesome. Damn, 10 months. I'm impressed. That's so cool. If you want to join the Pop Fam um, your special tier, make sure you hit the join button on the screen right now. Uh, just be like Ben. It's so easy to spot you in the crowd then. All right. So now what I want to do is I need to install Firebase Admin into my project. So I'm going to type in npmi Firebase Admin. The reason why I'm doing npmi in this case is because I'm on a package lock right here, okay? So now we are installing it into the, the project. So let's get, let that get done. I'm just wondering, did I install that in the correct directory? Yeah, I believe I did. I'm in the functions folder. Yes. No, I didn't. Did I? Oh, God damn it. I did the wrong thing. Okay. So at this point, what you can do is if you did what I just did, you can actually go ahead and delete that, delete that. Oh, damn it. Okay. And delete the, the node modules outside of here. So I'm going to get rid of that. Just ignore that I just did that. Forget that. Right. Don't make that mistake. Delete the node modules outside of here. We don't want those. Nope. Okay, we want the node modules inside the functions folder. CD into the functions folder and then do what I did. So npmi Firebase admin. Okay, that's better. You should have it inside of your uh, your functions folder. All right, easy mistake to make, easy to fix as well. Don't worry. Okay, so at this point, we've got the functions folder. We've got the Firebase admin done. So in Firebase admin now, Ashwin says, hey, Sonny, you rock, man. Thank you, dude. I appreciate you. So I'm going to do a bunch of imports, right? And I want you to just follow along with me. So I'm importing everything as admin from Firebase Admin, importing get apps and importing the service account key, which is essentially just the service account key that we, we downloaded earlier. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to check if we've already initialized any app previously. So if get apps will basically return to us any initialized apps, right? We're going to say if the length actually exists, in which case there is, you know, there is no apps available. So no app has been initialized. Then we're going to initialize an app using the credentials. We're basically going to pass in admin credentials certificate. We're going to pass in the certificate to this uh, call, okay? And that basically authorizes us. Okay, so once we've done that, I can then access my database in an admin perspective. Okay, so I can say const admin equals admin.firestore and then export my database variable. So this will allow me to now make a database call from the perspective of an admin. Okay, so once we have this in play, we can now do what we need to do inside of index.ts. So what I would now want to do is essentially once I've actually gone ahead and... Um, once I've actually gone ahead and created that um, scraper on uh, inside of Bright Data, at that point, I want to go ahead and actually input something, a collection here called searches, and just store a piece of information because then my client is going to then listen to that information, okay? So at this point, for the index, I want to, uh, I want to import the following at the top of the file. My admin DB, import everything from admin, and then I'm going to I'm going to go ahead and say the following. So I'm going to say from the request, what we get back, I want to go ahead and pull the success and ID from the body. Okay, so we're going to use those two things. That's what comes back inside the scraper. Remember, when I tested the webhook, those things did come back. So we're going to say if there was no success, okay, then what I'm going to do, for example, if that call failed for whatever reason, I'm then going to go ahead and update the database. So the way I do this is I simply go ahead and firstly, I need to make this an asynchronous function. I'm going to say await, okay, admin db dot collection of, and then I'm going to go into the searches collection. This is where we're going to store all our information. Then I'm going to go into the doc, which is the ID. And this is going to be the collector ID. And then I'm going to set the following information. So, right, so I'm going to set the status to become error. And then I'm going to use the server timestamp. And the way we do this in the admin SDK is we say admin.firestore timestamp now. Okay. And what this will do is if there was an error for whatever reason, it's going to go ahead and update that information. But when you use the set function, you have to be very careful with Firebase. You have to include a second uh, options uh, argument with, with merge true. That means that you're not overriding everything. You still, you're basically merging the data that was already there. And then you're going to go ahead and do it. Okay. Now, if you did get past that, we want to go ahead and actually fetch the results from Bright Data, right? Now, obviously, I haven't actually done the Bright Data bit yet, but we're going to go ahead and preemptively get this kind of setup. So I'm going to go ahead and say const data equals await fetch results, and then I'm going to go ahead and pass in the ID, right? So I need to make this fetch results function. So what I'm now going to do is at the top of the file, I'm going to say const fetch results equals an asynchronous function which takes an id which is a string 
okay? And now what I'm going to do is I need to make a request to Bright Data. Now, on Bright Data, what you would have found was if we go over to our Initiate by API, as you can see here, this request actually is how we collect the results from the first step whereby we initiate the call. So this will be doing from our Next.js app, right? So we're going to do that afterwards. But afterwards, I need to get the results. So I'm going to show you how we get the results over here. So basically what I'm going to do is I'm going to get an API key first. So const API key. Right, and you need to go ahead and get your API key now. At this point, you can use process.env and you should be doing it this way, and then have an environment file over here. So, let's go ahead and start off with that. I ran into a few issues, I hope that I don't get into that issue right now. Uh, let's actually see if we can get around this. So, I'm going to go ahead and type in the following. So, <clears throat> let's imagine we had an environment file for uh, bright data API key. Okay, now this key, how do we get it? We simply go over to our Bright Data settings. We go into our account settings and we simply go to our API tokens over here, right? Now, once you've done this, there'll be a way to, you'll be able to go ahead and actually generate a token here. I've actually gone ahead and done it. So I've actually already done it. So I've already got my token here. But if you refresh your token after that, you basically will get a string, right? So I've already got my string. So in this case, I'm going to grab it over here. So at this point, all I wanted you to do was I could revoke this token and just do it again. So I could, I mean, to be honest, I could do that. Let's just delete this token. Um, okay, I don't want to do this right now. Okay, but you have to get that 2FA and stuff. But once you basically set up your token, you'll get a little string, okay? Um, even, no, you can't do it here as well. Okay, that's fine. So at this point, I want you to go in here and just, I'm going to paste it. So I'm going to paste my key and then I'm going to close the screen. So I'm pasting the key. Right, so it's like a, a long digit with dashes between it. I'm now hitting save. And then I'm going ahead and I'm closing my environment file. Okay. And then I'm closing the index.ts file. So there we go. Okay. Now afterwards, what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually get my environment, my environment file variable name. I'm going to go back to my code. I'm going to say process.env bright data API key. Cool. So now we've got the API data key inside of our code what i'm going to do now is i'm going to go ahead and <laughs> thank you jay jay sent me the two two factor code i don't actually need it now but we're gonna say const res equals await fetch okay and then i need to make a call to the data set that comes back so first things first i'm going to use back ticks because i want to do string interpolation then i'm going to go ahead and do the following call so i'm going to go ahead and pass it to this api.bradia.com forward slash dca data set with the parameter id being passed in okay now once that's done well we actually need to set pass in things like the uh, the method and so forth so the method here will be a get request uh, by default it is a get request but i just want to specify it and then we have to pass in a authorization bearer key Okay, so um, Charu says, man, you have a natural time to break down complex concepts and making them accessible to everyone. I've learned so much from this channel. Keep it up. You're amazing. You're doing amazing. Well, you're a great true gem. Thank you so much. That's actually a really lovely message, man. We're almost at 600 likes. Keep the likes flying in and keep that energy. I really do appreciate you all, right? And this is where I will naturally tend to see a drop off because this is where it gets pretty tricky. I'm not going to lie, right? But we're going to get through it. Don't worry about it, right? So in this case, we've got the headers here and we've got the authorization and the bearer token, okay? So you need to make sure you have that, otherwise it just won't work, okay? Now, once that's done, we can get the information by saying const data equals await res.json, right? Then what we need to do is essentially we need to check something. Now, the reason why this is important is we need to go ahead and see if the data is in a built state. Now, when we scrape data using bright data, it's not a straightforward two-second process, right? Remember, it has to spin up IPs and proxies. It has to then go and scrape the data, which means that sometimes, even when the job's finished, it could just be kind of consolidating the information. It couldn't, might not be ready for us when we go ahead and try and get the information. So we're going to create a recursive call here, which basically, in some sense, will retry it uh, every few seconds, right? So in this case, it's just going to keep retrying the function until it hits, until the data is ready, okay? So here I'm going to say, if the data dot status is either building or still collecting information right then what i'm going to do is i'm going to go ahead and say uh you're not complete yet so i'm going to fetch again in five seconds right so I'm trying again but in this case we're not doing five seconds you can do a little time out there if you want i'm just gonna say not complete yet try again right and this actually does do the trick a lot of the time right so in this case now it's going to go ahead and fetch results so what this does is it will go down 
then it will go ahead and actually call itself again and then it will keep repeating this until and i found on the second one it always gets it okay so this is going to help us out um and then here what i'm going to do just for now i'm going to uh, cast any here because you should have a return type but for this demo i'm not going to get involved in that right and then what you can actually do is set debug points right so what i was doing when i was debugging this is i was saying debug one and then i was saying debug two to double check when i get past this right so that's how i'd recommend if you get stuck at that point just make sure you go ahead and set debug points watch the logs and see what happens right then we're going to return the data afterwards Right, so that would be the call to get the results back. Okay, so after that point, we should have the results from the finished scraping. At that point, what I want to do is update the database. Right, so I'm going to do await admin DB collection searches doc and then set. And then what I want to do is over here, I'm going to set the status to complete, the updated at with the timestamp, and then I'm going to pass the results in like so. So I'm going to go ahead and pass it in like so, okay? And this will pass in the results and so forth. And then remember, again, because we're using the set function, I do need to do merge true, which means it's not going to override everything. It's still going to keep everything that's kind of in there. And then it's done, right? And then what I would really recommend is just add a console log here saying, we made it or, you know, like the finished scraping. I've wrote full circle in mine. I literally wrote this on mine just so I could see when I got to the end, right? But you can feel free to do whatever you want to do, okay? And then after that, you can say, you know, like, it really doesn't matter here what we're doing because the main thing that's really going on here is here we could just say, okay, like finished or um, we could say scraping, function finished right whatever really doesn't really matter here okay get rid of that so at this point the whole function the whole purpose of this is this is going to act as what we need it to do for what well, have i got a little error here let's see what is my pretty uh, freaking out about um my bearer api token okay it's dead yeah we're good All right so at this point now we have our function ready to use okay so let's go ahead and get rid of that sorry okay so i'm going to go over to my terminal and now I'm going to restart my function over here. So see load environment variables, blah, blah, blah. So I'm going to stop that. I'm going to restart my server. Okay. So now I technically have the backend kind of ready, right? I technically have the backend ready. So at this point, oh, we've got a little error because I have a full stop instead of a, oh, you know, see, it's always the small things. It's always the tiny things that catch us. There we go. I'm here on serve. Oh, Zoni actually caught it out. He goes, you use point instead of comma after the fetch. Is that a problem? Yes. Oh, he goes, that is a problem. Yeah. So you found it, dude. Found it before I did it. Um, let's go ahead and cancel out. So it's actually going to spin up the server in a second. Starting emulators. There we go. And then we should see it being deployed. Again, it's on 5001 and it's still being forwarded on that same URL. So we don't have to update it, right? So this is good for the development purposes. So now... This is pretty good, guys, right? This is exactly what I wanted. So now what we can do is we can go over to our front end again. So this is good. We can kind of forget about this for a bit. For a bit. We can go over to our Next.js app. Okay, so now we're back on the Next.js front. Okay, so back over at this uh, on, on this side. I know it can be a little bit confusing, but we're going to get there, right? Now what we're going to do is we're going to go over to our app, localhost 3000. Here we are. Now what I want to do is when I type in something here and hit enter, I need to execute a bright data uh, API call, right? And this is going to be where the magic happens. So let's create that functionality in the header. So what I firstly want to do is go over to our header.tsx, which I'm already in, right? And then I want to do the API call to activate the scraper. And I need to simply pass through the search input. Okay, so I need to create a call for this. So I'm going to say const. Uh, this is going to be an asynchronous function as well. So I'm going to do async here. And here I'll say const and I'll say response equals await fetch. And this will be a forward slash uh, activate scraper call. Right? You can do forward slash API, but in this case, I'm using the new approach, which is just to activate scraper. So we're going to say forward slash activate scraper. And then I'm going to go ahead and pop in the following. And this is going to be a post function. And I'm going to pass in the headers, which are going to basically say that we are passing in application JSON because we're going to sort of JSON, JSONify the data, right? And then we're going to pass in the body of this, which is going to be JSON.stringify. And then what I want to do is I'm going to pass the key of search and I'm just simply going to pass through the value of input, okay? 
So this will make a, res, uh, a request to the Activate Scraper endpoint inside of our Next.js app, all right? Now, at this point, we need to actually create that, that function, all right? So over here in Activate Scraper, this is going to be where we receive the post request, okay? We don't actually need that now. Cool. Um, <clears throat> let's check this out. So um, Luke Skywalker is in the house. What's up? <laughs> Good to see you. So at this point, we're almost at 600 likes. Let's go, All right? So now what I want to do is I need to set up my scraper on this side. So what we are going to say is we're going to say const. What I like to do as well is I just have little console logs which tell me what's happening, right? So this actually helps me out quite a lot. So we're going to say submitting. And then here I'm going to say the search is the search. I actually want to check firstly that I'm getting the search that I want, right? So at this point, we can actually just test this right now, to be honest with you. We can do command J. I can sort of pull this over to see my server. And if I type in hello world and I hit enter, we can see search is undefined, right? So I'm not actually getting my search, which is incorrect, right? So that's not actually what I wanted. Uh, to be honest with you, I think the reason why is because we're not using the correct... Uh, Ah, this is going to be tricky now because um, we're using the new APIs that I haven't even practiced. <laughs> I kind of ran with this this right now. So we're going to do, we're just going to figure it out. It's fine. Um, so we're going to go to root segment request response. I need the request. There we are. And then inside of the request object, we have the request.body. Okay. So it is request. Right, let's just double check this. So it's going to be uh, request, request.body. And I'm going to go ahead and get this out of there. Now, it's freaking out because it's not having, does not exist on readable stream. Oh, I need to await it. My bad. Oh, I see. Equals await. And this one will be, does not exist. No. Okay. This is super annoying. Um, request body read only stream of the body contents. Da, da, da. Let's do const <coughs> um, search equals request body. Request.body is a readable stream. How are we passing this though? I mean, I haven't, I, to be honest with you, I haven't looked at this properly yet. I've actually just done it with the, um, with the old route of doing things. But I kind of want to see if we can just check this out the way I want it to do it. So request.body. Let's, let's just see what it says, to be honest with you. Let's say submit request.body. Yeah. And then let's have a look here. So submitting request.body. And let's look over here for ourselves. So you guys are seeing a live debugging session as I'm figuring out. MacBook Pro, bam. Cool. So we've got a readable stream. Look for this readable stream. Okay. So to be honest with you, I don't know. Um, oh, this is where I want to figure out. So I'm going to have a quick little... Um, check here we haven't got any we i mean i've got the music pretty low right now so i'm gonna have a quick little dive into it so right now i'm just looking at next just examples of post requests um and i'm just talking you through it as i do it okay so <clears throat> working this very soon okay so I, what i might actually do then guys is do it the traditional way and then when i figure it out i'll make another tutorial on it okay because uh, right now I don't spend too much time on this to, to kind of figure out that side of things. So that's fine. We're going to refactor it. We're going to get it done. But I wanted to show you how we kind of do that in the first place. Um, and then obviously once I figure that out, we can go ahead and go back and do it. I should have really kind of tweaked that a bit beforehand, but it's fine. right? But this is how you actually go ahead and get that request. Okay. So right now what I want to do is I'm going to go ahead and change my header to simply be towards API forward slash activate scraper. And then I'm going to go into, so we're not going to use this route. We're going to simply use the traditional route. So I'm going to go ahead and create a activate scraper.ts file. And here what I do is I simply copy my hello example and I can modify this example right here. Okay. So this example, what I'm going to do is the next API response will include data or an error. And then the data is going to include a collection ID or a start ETA. So a collection ID or a star ETA. And then we're also going to have a type error, which is going to be like so. Okay. 
And then the JSON that we end up returning for now, we're going to figure that one out in a second, right? So let's create this function. So this is actually now sitting at the forward slash um, API forward slash activate scraper function. Okay. So um, I honestly, I will figure that out. I really do. I will figure that out. I'll make a tutorial for it uh, and get that forward. Uh, I just want you to see that it's not always, you know, it's not always super smooth. It's, it's the natural reality and that's completely fine. All right. So we're going to say const here at this point. We're going to say const search. Um, const search equals request.body. Oops. What the hell? Request.body.search. And we just passing. Oh, we're about to pass 600 likes. Let's go, guys. Let's push it fast. Push it fast. I'm going to do this uh, rec body. There we go. And um, so we're going to pull the search out. And then what I can actually do is I can just simply debug this and check. I can say the search is blah, right? And then here, just to kind of get rid of this little error right now, I can just grab that for a second, make that whatever, just so it satisfies. Um, let's go to our application over here. And what I would highly recommend you do at this point is pull up your terminal, type in something like MacBook Pro. Uh, and then you see, we should see, oh, oh. Okay, I'm still requesting from the. I need to save. That's the old U, uh, URL. So let's go ahead and do it now. MacBook Pro. Let me see. Searches at MacBook Pro. Okay. So that's the way that we traditionally did it, which is fine for now. We can do that. Uh, and then obviously you can refactor this demo tutorial afterwards as, as you wish. Okay. So um, the search is there. And then what we're going to do is make a request. So now I'm going to start speeding up so that way we can get this done. We're going to say async function. But we can say const response equals await uh, fetch so await fetch and oh we're like one like away from 600 and i'm gonna get the music back up i, I need the energy i need the drive right so who's gonna who's gonna break that 600 i'm gonna have a quick little water break as well oh my god it's sitting up 599 Carson says, we're, oh, there we go. They're at 601. That's what I'm talking about. Nice. I was like, I was waiting for it. I was like, I was like, oh man, we're so close. All right, this is cool. All right, now we've got the fetch. All right, let's go ahead and get this down. So I'm going to go ahead and make a, um, a fetch to the correct call. So at this point, to get the correct uh, endpoint that you need to call, what I would recommend you do is go over to your scrapers. So the scraper that we just went ahead and created was this one right here. Go ahead and type in initiate by API and over here. So this is what you want to do. You see here, right there, that Q next one, you want to go ahead and copy that URL. Okay. So I need you to go ahead and copy that. Then here we're going to do back text. And then just like that, that's the trigger for me. Okay. Then what you want to do is pass in the following. So you need to say it's a post method and you want to pass in some headers as well as the content type being application JSON. The headers in this case is going to be the bright data API key. Now we haven't set the API key here. So in this case, remember we set it for the previous one, but we did not set it for this one. So in this case, what I'm going to do is set the API key. So go into this uh, create a file called .env.local, bam, pop it in. And I've actually got my key already from previous uh, previously. So I'm just gonna go ahead and pop in my key right now. So I popped in my key and I'm now closing my environment file. Okay, at that point, you should see that it loads the environment file from your environment local. Okay, so there's no need to reload the file. We now have our environment file, uh, our variable being passed in as a bearer token, which is great. And then we're going to stringify the search into the uh, into the the, the, the body. Right, so in this case, we're going to stringify the search into the body, just like so. Okay. Now, once we've done that, I'm going to go ahead and close off my search. There we go. So I always get a bit mixed up here. There we are. So now we've got the response, right? So in this case, we are making a request. So what we're essentially doing is triggering it as if we were triggering it here, but we're passing in the search term from our front side, okay? Now what I wanna do is after that comes back, I will capture the data by doing response.json. So in this case, we're gonna go ahead and say response.json. We'll, we'll log out the data and then we should get two pieces of information from the data. This is the collection ID and the start ETA, right? Once we've done that, I now need to go ahead and create a, uh, from the admin SDK, as this is still the backend for our Next.js application, I now need to create an admin uh, instance. So what we need to do here, 
is I need to go to the top level for my Next.js app here. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a Firebase admin.ts file. Okay. Now for the Firebase admin file, what I want you to do is you can do this two ways. You can either pass in your service account key, which is uh, one way, or you can actually go ahead and um, pass in your, um, or set this in your environment variable. It's completely up to you. Uh, how you want to go ahead and go forward with that All right so in this case i'm going to go ahead and pop in the following at the top and we need to install firebase admin into this project because remember we did it previously on the other project which was the back end of this build so i'm going to go ahead and install that into the app firebase admin just like so okay energy overload that's what i'm talking about amazing amazing stuff right so in this case we are installing the firebase admin api then what i want you to do is remember that same file that we went ahead and downloaded so there's two ways you can do it you can either do it this way or you can actually there's a trick i did in the last build which you can actually use but i'm not going to go over that fully right now okay um what you can do is you can get the, the account key so i'm going to go ahead and pull in that um service account key right here so i'm going to grab this and pop it in like here i'm going to rename this file and this is the one that i got from firebase so rename it to service account key dot json go ahead close that uncomment it out okay i remember because this is on the server it's actually pretty safe to do that right then we're going to have the same example of how we initialize the app as we did previously on the back end and then that will allow us to have an admin sdk uh, instance right so in this case now i can access the database in the form of an admin from the back end right so in this case oh there you go <laughs> i always do that <laughs> anyway we've got this down so what i want you to do now is to basically go ahead and import the admin so admin db from the top like so and we're going to say await admin.db collection and we're going to go into the searches collection okay and then we're also going to go into the document here so here I will, i'm going to say it's the collection id which gets returned so basically what's happening is when i trigger the build it will give me back the collection um the collector id right so in this case we'll actually have a record or an id so what i'm actually going to do here is use that collection id as the unique identifier for that document then i'm going to set a bunch of information inside i'm going to set the search then i'm going to set the start eta status and the updated app like so okay now we do need access to admin at the top so what i will do is head to the top and simply do import admin from firebase admin because we always want to use the admin server timestamp okay so now that we have that in place we are going to go ahead and say uh, if that all went well we are going to return a status of 200 and we are simply going to return the collection id and the start eta this is getting uh, pretty pumped up i think we're going to get 700 likes this is crazy all right so we can say collection id start eta cool all right i know this is a tricky build but don't worry it's fine this is levels right you can go ahead and progress your levels this video is going to always be here for you to go ahead and experience webhooks experience web scraping all that good stuff all right so at this point now we've got that down we're going to go ahead and hit save right <clears throat> so i do want to surround this entire block in a try catch as well so where i am doing a the top right here i want to do a try statement and if at any point any of this fails so i'm going to wrap the entire thing in that i'm going to say catch the error and just basically yeah give me a nice little error message as well so in that case i will do something along the lines of this so for now i'm just going to go ahead and assume this is any i'm not going to get too far into this but yeah we're going to log out the error if anything happened okay it's handy for debugging all that kind of stuff so so at this point <laughs> so at this point we're going to go ahead and test it out right so let's try it out guys we're going to go into and i'm going to show you how you can debug and check this yourself so what i want you to do i have your local host open then I want you to have your Firebase instance open as well. Okay. So I want you to have your fire because a few things are going to happen right now. So have your Firebase instance open, kind of make it a bit smaller so you can see like, you know, your collection here. Then I need you to go to your bright data here, pull this open as well. And in bright data, I want you to go to your web scraper. I want you to uh, click this and click on statistics. And here you can see where your runs are occurring. Right, so now think about what's going to happen. I'm going to run you through all of this as well. Do not stress, right? So we're going to go into our app. 
And what I'm going to do right now, guys, is I'm going to go ahead and initialize a build, which means that what we should see here is that this will go ahead and start another build the minute I call this. So if I go ahead and type in MacBook Pro, hit enter, right? So what we should see now is look, oh, it's doing it. We have this ID. Let's see if it got added into our database. So hit a little refresh. We should have a searches collection. Hey, there we go. And there it is, FN amazing stuff nice and as you can see it's in a pending state right this is how we're eventually going to reach a point like this where it's pending right so at this point we have the pending state this thing is scraping the information so this is great this is really good right and if i go into my actual build and see the terminal logs you can see look the data is collection id start eta so this is what's happening right so this is really good this is what we want to see and what will happen is eventually this will scrape the pages and it will return the records. Now, what we can even do is actually wait on the back end and see if something happens over on this side, right? So over on the back end, if we look at the, uh, the, the server running, once this finishes, this will effectively ping our webhook and then it will go ahead and uh, execute the code, which should then change this to go ahead and become the results that were populated from here okay so as you can see it's fulfilling the pages so it's begun the scraping process this is exciting stuff guys right it's fulfilling the scrapes if you go ahead and check on it it's 50 percent of the way done and just to go ahead and show you right now i kind of don't want to miss this so look two pages 16 records we should hit our webhook in just a second so it's wrapping up the job right now so typically after it's done, it will take a few seconds to go ahead and you know process the webhook, that kind of stuff. Uh, and now, as I mentioned before, we don't even have to be on our client anymore because this is gonna happen through a webhook architecture. It's gonna hit the webhook. Now it's gonna go ahead and modify this if our webhook logic was correct. Okay, so let's go ahead and be patient. So oh, you can see something has happened. We went ahead and hit this. Um, oh, okay, I don't think my function was actually running. Oh no, it did, it did, it did. It said, um, Oh, did it? Is this working? Okay, so it's running again. Scrape complete. Finish. Your function was good. It run. Oh. All right. So my what failed on me was my timestamp. Right. So again, this this can happen. Okay. But you see what's happened here, right? So what actually happened was we ran it from the client. So I want to stress this because it's very important. We ran it from the client. Again, we ran it from the client. It hit bright data over here which is exactly what happened here. Bright data started scraping Amazon, which was great. It sent a completed message to our webhook, which means that we saw our webhook get fired off and hit, okay? At that point, this is the webhook that was on it. At that point, it tried to update Firebase. Firebase had a problem with the um, timestamp, right? Which happens way too much right so there's a bit of an annoying issue right now with that whereby if i do mvmls are we still on 18 yeah we are so i keep i actually run into this issue way too much to be honest with you um <clears throat> it was for the updated that timestamp um so it was here i believe yeah so where am i using dot now it's there right so two places that we're using it and let me just ensure that i'm using it from the correct instance of firebase admin okay yeah so it's still coming from the right place oh actually wait a second i think i'm on the wrong build um yep i'm i get confused myself uh so i'm gonna just double check my imports are correct yep they are um let's go ahead and try this again Okay, so let's go ahead and do npm run serve. So that timestamp can be a bit of an issue. Don't give up because honestly, it's it's just a temporary thing. Like I don't know why that that timestamp. And there's actually a, a whole Stack Overflow uh, debate about this right now, where they're trying to fix that. Um, I think it's been since a certain upgrade that that's been a problem. But when you're watching it, it, may not happen. Okay, so let's go ahead and run this test again. Let's go ahead and run it again. So we're going to type in iPad Pro. Hit enter and now what you can see is it will hit um bright data bam this gets affected as well because we gone ahead and popped it in here we can actually delete the ipad pro uh, the macbook pro example as well because that's like a, a dead one now and then we can see here 
And then again, you can correlate it because it's I7E, I7E right there. Okay, so all this kind of stuff's happening right now. Um, Mario says, I miss pop energy and science inspiration motivation along with these amazing teacher skills. Thank you so much, dude. I appreciate you. So at this point, while this is happening, I do want to kind of get past this point. I want to show you once and then we can kind of build it out. But I do want to demonstrate the entire process. But I hope you can see like when we do obviously work with webhooks, this is why it's handy to have ngrok, this kind of stuff, because we can develop locally and debug it. Whereas if I was doing this live, I would actually, or not live, I guess, when I, if I was doing this um, with deployed URLs, I would constantly have to deploy my app every time I made a change. That's just not efficient. It's not a good way to work, right? So this is a way that I would highly recommend you do it. We're almost at 700 likes as well. So just, uh, thank you so much guys for tuning in and keeping up with me, right? Um, amazing stuff so let's double see what's happening so again that's going to scrape again some stuff could be really quick some stuff can take a little bit more time depends on the ip the proxy network the busyness also this is a developer uh demo right now as well okay someone says do i use a tile manager yes i do use a tile manager um i can't remember the name of it for the life of me uh but yeah they help out a lot Okay, so while that's happening, what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to continue on with the build uh, and, and carry on doing the things that we need to do. So I'm going to need to go ahead and set up on Firebase. I'm going to have to go ahead and set up a, uh, a instance for our function. So in this case, I need to set up a client access to the Firestore database. So in this case, I'm going to go ahead and create a new app. Here I type in bright data youtube build uh register the app and then we wait for it we get this add firebase sdk we've already done all this blah 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 we can go continue to console nice all right and then what i want you to do at this point is go into your code so we are now inside of the next js app yep over here next js app and i want you to go into where we had Firebase admin, I want you to create a, a file called Firebase. So firebase.ts, okay? And here, I want you to go ahead and do the following. So we're gonna firstly install Firebase into the project because it's different to Firebase admin. Remember that, right? So in this case, I'm gonna say yarn add Firebase. Nice, okay? And then, to be honest with you, that might have been what it was. No, I think I did actually. Firebase, I mean, okay. Um, that one's scraping away. Let's leave it to do its thing. Okay, so while that's installing, we can go ahead and actually prepare the code for this. So we can go ahead and do this, bam. And then I can pop in my Firebase config. So the config that I actually had, if you go down here, was this one here. So you just need to copy your config. Go ahead and pop it in like so. And then we're gonna do a simple check here to basically check if the app was already initialized or not, okay? So I'm gonna go ahead and pop in here and this basically checks if the app's already initialized, get the app that's initialized, otherwise initialize the app with the new credentials. And then what we do is we get the uh, instance of the database by saying get Firestore. And this is using Firebase version nine on the client side, okay? So, bam, this is looking good. We've got the database ready. Now, once that's done, let's just see for a second. Sometimes it can hang if depending on, you know, if there's an IP network or, and plus I have the demo gods against me right now, which is completely fine, it happens. All right, so I'm just gonna go ahead and modify something right now. <clears throat> so, what I'm gonna do is quickly go back to my, um, my code and just continue on with something here. So uh, I'm on the front end. There we are. It gets super confusing when you've got all these different things open. And obviously on one screen while I'm teaching it, it gets a little bit intense, but we're fine. We're good. So what I want to do is that will go ahead and actually populate the database the way that we wanted it once it comes in. Now what I kind of need to do is on the front end, I need to actually go ahead and check out the results themselves. Right. So once I've actually gone ahead and um, so once we go to let's go to the header quickly. Yep. So 
Once we activate the scraper, it returned back a collection ID. I can use that collection ID to direct the user to forward slash search forward slash that collection ID. Then we can create a dynamic route on Next.js to that page, and then we can render the information based on that ID. So I'm gonna show you exactly how we can do that, right? So first things first, I need a router, right? So I'm gonna go and say const router equals use router, and we're gonna go ahead and make sure you don't make this mistake. Use next navigation now if you're using Next.js 13, because that's the way we do things. It was super confusing, but yeah, that's the way you gotta do it. And then what we're gonna do is underneath the response, we're gonna go ahead and firstly pass the information from the response, right? <clears throat> this is when we put into the pending state. Then I'm gonna say router.push and I'm gonna do back ticks for string interpolation, forward slash search, forward slash, and this is gonna be the collection ID. So if I hit save now, what we will find is if I go over to this page and I go ahead and type in, for example, iPad Pro, right? Or let's just type in PlayStation 5, right? And now what you'll find is I will get redirected to forward slash search forward slash a collector ID. Which makes sense because remember what we did is we actually pushed this over to fire um, to the uh, scraper. The scraper was initialized, gave us an ID. I stored that ID inside of Firebase, but I want to direct the user to forward slash search forward slash that ID. Now, how do I go ahead and set up a route like this? Well, it's very easy with Next.js 13. All we have to do is go into our forward slash app directory. Then we go into this click on page. Let's go ahead and type in search to represent the forward slash search. Then I'm going to have a dynamic component to that, right? So what I want to do here is it's going to be forward slash a random uh, kind of a dynamic ID. So what I do is I create a folder inside with square bracket notation and call it ID. You can call this whatever you want, really. You can call it ID you can call it, you know, collection ID. I want to keep it simple, call it ID. And inside of ID, I'm going to type in page. So this is inside of that ID folder, page.tsx. Okay, now inside of here, we do RFCE. We go ahead and we create the page that we are looking for. Now, this is going to be known as the essentially just the search page, right? So it's going to be the search page. And what's really good about these pages is we can actually go ahead and get something called the params out of these pages. And as part of the params, we get the, um, so let me go ahead and just make sure I don't mess this up. Yeah, so we get the uh, page params. So naturally when you have a dynamic route, in the page props, this portion here, the wildcard portion, it gets passed through as a param. And then the ID in this case is whatever you decided to call that, right? So if I called it like, you know, collection ID, that would be collection ID and so forth. So I'm just gonna create a type definition for this. So that way we can go ahead and protect ourselves. So in this case, I'm gonna say params with ID string. Cool. So we've got this down. And then inside of here, I'm going to go ahead and just, um, so now I have access to that, that, that URL right there. Okay. And I just want to double check, did my scraper finish loading? So my scraper did find the records. Did it actually populate the database or did I get the same issue? Um, I think it was the same issue. Yeah. So reading now, so that, that seems to be breaking my, my function here. So we can see node version 16. I believe it's because it's running in node version 16. That's the problem that I'm seeing here. So node version 16 is causing that to happen. Uh, although I believe I am running it in node version 18. Okay, which is strange. Let's see, what did I start it with? Node version 18 at the host. Okay, so I'll tell you what, what we can do is you can actually i mean you could use the created or finish that as well right so what we can do here as well just to, for, to sort of bypass this for now is rather than using the timestamp that comes back here what we can do is where i've done scrape complete you see inside the request body it's always handy because you can see what comes back right we can use the finish time which is completely fine so we can say the finished time Although the finish time is in the timestamp fashion, which is slightly different to the Firestore returned value. And the only reason this is happening is because my runtime of my library right now is actually stuck in 16, which is a bit annoying. Um, so let's go ahead and just force this to, let's change this up. Let's just double check it. MVM use 18. I'm gonna force it back into now using node version 14. Let's now do it again, right? So let's go ahead and say yarn run serve and do it again. Just make sure because you see in that debug, we saw that it was node version 16. 
I know it's crazy, right? These things are so hidden away sometimes, but that can actually be the problem. Mr. Frank, what is up, dude? OG in the house. He's if you remember for six months, but Frank's been around for way longer than that. Um, he goes, let's go. Good to see you here, man. Uh, James goes, this is sweet. Cannot wait to watch. Cannot wait to watch it all. 5 a.m. for him. Oh, awesome stuff, man. Thank you for tuning in. Um, okay, so this is loaded now. So let's try and do the same thing again. I told you it's going to take a lot of debugging, but once you get it, I promise you it'll be worth it. Okay, so let's go ahead and run another test. iPad Pro. <coughs> And as you can see, this should have kickstarted a, a, a scraper. There you go. Job is starting. Great stuff. And I do want to just clean up my screen a bit because it's kind of chaos right now. So what I am going to do is I'm going to move my backend code over to uh, this side over here. So that way we've got a different page for it, right? So my backend code is over here now. And we should be able to understand when it gets hit on this endpoint we should be able to see a version as long as it's on node version 18 that will be fine okay can you not use the now function from the default js date and time well if you decide to do that the problem is that you're actually going to go ahead and uh, do the server time zone. however you might be right because it's still going to be in the uh it's still going to be in the the cloud function so that might actually work but let's oh 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 no was it almost there oh no so okay same bloody problem god damn it see it's doing it again it's trying to read it and it's just not finding it oh. okay <laughs> it's fine for now to bypass it i'm going to use um the finished uh app function okay so i'm going to cut this off um that's okay oh god damn it it's so annoying um but yeah that's 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 what it is it's the node versioning being a mismatch here so at this point what i'm going to do is over at my request.body i'm going to do instead of this i'm going to do <coughs> finished okay and we're going to use this for now it probably will mess up my uh sorting a little bit later on but we come back to that afterwards that's fine okay but i just want to show you because this it, it works and i just want you to see the entire flow it's beautiful Right, but I really also appreciate you guys watching this side because this is the reality of coding. And it's not always like, you know, clean, straightforward. It's, it's debugging, which is why I want you to see this. So MacBook Pro, bam, hit enter on the search. And now what we should see is another MacBook Pro spin. Okay, this is starting off. So once this is done and it scraped the results, we should see this fly in over here. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go ahead and cut this so oh no my st oh god damn it my functions stopped no 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 okay we need to try and get it spun up before this finishes otherwise there's no webhook to hit uh come on we're almost there we're almost there 650 likes let's go that's not oh damn it no admin is used but never declared oh come on man let's go okay run serve is it gonna beat me to it it's gonna miss the webhook because right now it's not running, right? So there's no webhook to, to run this off. So we'll see. Let's see. Come on, come on, come on. It can make it. It can make it. Okay, we're up. Ah, there we are. So now it's up. The webhook's up. And um, this is still running on that. So we're good. All right, so once that's done, then uh, that will go ahead and ping this. And then we can kind of check on it in a bit. All right, so back to the code. Okay, so once that comes back, the optimistic approach will be that we will actually be able to go ahead and see the um what, what's it called react firebase hooks react firebase hooks there we are all right i need to access react firebase hooks so at this point once it comes back uh, on the front end so i'm back on the front end now what i need to do is i need to actually get the a real-time listener collection to that document because what's going to happen is there's going to be a, a result that come back and i want to go ahead and log through that right so what i'm going to do is i'm going to use this lovely library react firebase hooks so i'm just going to install this into my project like so so i'm going to go into the front end i'm going to go command j i'm going to do yarn add react firebase hooks okay so while that's happening, what we're gonna do, and a lot of people use this, right? Red Firebase hooks. Now I'm gonna go ahead and connect to it. And we've already got our client side database connection. So what we can now do is we can actually go ahead and import the use document. The use document basically pulls in a real time listener. Now remember, 
as we are now having listeners and all this kind of stuff, we have to convert this to a client side component, right? So in this case, or you, you could do it on a more granular level, so it's not at the page level, but yeah, I'm gonna just do it at this level for now. And then we're gonna go ahead and actually initialize that, uh, or pull in that real time listener, right? So what we have here is a snapshot, we have the loading state and we have an error state. This is all from the library. We say equals user document. And now the magic part here is we pass in the Firebase version nine syntax for how we can go ahead and actually pull in uh, the special reference to the database that we're looking for. So here, what we need is the document so we're going to import that from Firestore. Then we get the DB instance, which is going to be the database instance from our local Firebase file. Not Firebase admin, Firebase file, right? Then we're going to go into the searches collection. So just no, okay, sorry, searches. And then the ID, which is the document. So at this point, this will give me back everything inside of my Firebase uh, database at the specific document that I'm after. So searches for slash an ID, and it will be here. Okay, so let me just double check on that job and see how we're looking. All right, so this one's a little bit stuck at the moment. Um, that's completely fine. Sometimes it can happen again. We, it's IP proxy network. Sometimes these things can happen. We haven't dialed in on that yet, but what we're gonna do next is I'm gonna build it out as if we have that information available to us. So let's go ahead and do that right now. So where's my front end code? I'm gonna move the back end code over there for now way too hectic right so we're gonna say if it's loading right so while that data is loading i'm gonna simply return a bunch of information so i'm just gonna go ahead and shorthand this a little bit i'm just gonna say loading the results make it like our life a little bit easier so i'm gonna say loading the results with a bit of text and coloring i'm gonna say if it doesn't exist i'm just gonna return them you know nothing <coughs> essentially then i'm gonna go ahead and do um if it uh, if it does list or if it's pending, it's going to be uh, essentially saying that we're scraping the results from Amazon, right? So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to say if the status of the information so that comes back is in the pending state, I'm going to return the following. So I'm going to say return a div. And we're essentially going to say scraping the data from Amazon. Okay. And we should be able to actually see this now. I'm going to give it a bit of styling here. So you can feel free to, you know, pause the video and see what I've styled here. It's just a bit of flex column, simple stuff here. And then I am going to add in like a nice little spinner interaction, that kind of stuff. But right now what you can see is we are scraping the results for Amazon for that search. But while that one's possibly on hold, right? What we can do is we can try another one. We can say something like PS5, right? And then I can go ahead and try and search. And as you can see, it pushes me over there, scraping the results from Amazon because now it's in the pending state. What we will see is that we'll see two scrapers active, right? So this one is starting off and you see that one, I was able to actually get the information much quicker. And there you go, it found the records, right? So it can be super quick as well. And let's just see on my back end how this is performing. So let's go ahead and head over here. So this will actually go ahead and boom, scrape is complete. Not again. No, yep, not complete again. Trying again. We remember, like I said before, if it doesn't get the... Um, so what can happen is, is, remember, it might not be ready straight away, but it did it. Right. And what I forgot to actually do here was say, woohoo, like full circle. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> yeah. I should. So here you shouldn't have the console log saying, woohoo, like full circle right just for now like while you're debugging it right full circle all right so obviously we're not gonna see that but what we should see now which i'm very confident about is if we go to this boom we have the results bang in that's what i'm talking about look the search was ps5 we get the results back that's what i'm saying guys yeah so look at that it works all right so let's try this one more time let's do ps5 again as a simple example what we'll see is it will trigger off the scraper it will go into firebase the the database so in this case um have i done it yep there you go so it's triggered it off so we've gone to that it's pending ps5 is now searching uh let me go ahead and pull this up so that one just seems to be a bit stuck which is fine it can happen um and then on the fulfillment side but again what's nice about this is that even if it is stuck when it's ready and it comes back it can go ahead and do a really nice kind of you know it will fly in as needed so um that's pretty cool mr frank five dollar donation he goes there we've just released commerce kit it's a cool shopify it's sdk oh nice dude awesome stuff i will definitely check it out 
All right. So once this is done, we will see this replaced with um, the, instead the um, the you know the information that we have over there All right i could actually use the start eta and then finish that to kind of sort everything in the correct way i think i might do that to be honest with you and that will actually prevent this issue from bothering us super in, a, in an annoying way so let's actually yeah let's do that okay so what we'll do is we'll go to our activate scraper function and then where we have instead of admin firestore timestamp now we can use the start eta to actually go ahead and do this all right, so that way we can actually end up using that as our updated that. So updated that was the start ETA. And then that's actually pretty good. Yeah, we could do that. Man, nice. Cool. All right, we can do that. All right. So at this point now, I am going to start programming the results, which is amazing, right? We have an example that we can use the results from, which means that we can start doing this thing. So I'm going to use this root. So forward slash search, forward slash that. And from here, I can now get the results. So let loading the results, bam, this will have all the results in it. Okay, <clears throat> so we go to our page, loading results, if snapshot pending, scraping the results, it already had that. And then here we can actually pop in the um, stuff. I'll add in the fancy spinners and all that good stuff afterwards. Um, <clears throat> so uh, we've got the div and inside of here, I'm gonna have another div and we're gonna pop in in here another div <laughs> and to save us a bit of time i'm just gonna pop in my h1 and a p tag right so it's just gonna basically go ahead here and say search results for the search term and it's gonna have you know if there were so so and so many results found it will go ahead and show that right so that search results for ps5 16 results were found right and then for the styling of the two divs above it again same thing it's just a bit of flex rules here going on and essentially what i've done here is on a smaller screen it will go into a flex column on a larger screen it will become a bit bigger right so it's very simple uh bit of styling there uh thank you so much stetko reen he goes much love from romania what's up dude i appreciate you for tuning in thank you so much all right um warp says this is a substantial project but it's a demo take it and make it your own later try to add new functionality 100 percent. that is literally golden advice i definitely appreciate that um walid says pop react i'm such a big fan dude i'm the ceo of a startup in dubai and i wanted to get a technical you've had a lot amazing walid uh, definitely reach out on uh, instagram or something and we can chat i could go for a coffee that's awesome um i'd love to go for a coffee with anyone in dubai so we can definitely do that uh, me and jay will come <laughs> so in this case we're going to go ahead and map through all the results now as well right so in this case uh we'll reach out or, or email us jay give him the email address and he can do it that way okay so at this point now what i'm going to do is i'm going to map through the results so what i'm going to do is i'm going to say if the results were greater than zero so the length was greater than zero i'm going to simply map out the results entirely right and what i'm going to do is i'm going to pass through the results like so right now obviously the results don't exist right so what i'm going to do is i'm going to pop this into a component of its own pass this a results.tsx rfce and now ben says what's up Papa react amazing stuff this is nice dude um we've got the results i'm a little bit disappointed i didn't get the next js 13 route done I, I will get that done though i will get that done i'll cover it in the zero to full tech real but that's why this channel is real you know i don't lie to you guys it is what it is and i will learn it and i will come back stronger with it and i will teach you it type props so here we're basically defining the results so result or oh, product sorry product there you go and you can see this product right now i've actually gone ahead and created a custom typing so i'm gonna say typings.d.ts to create a custom type definition and what i want to do here is just simply make a product type and i basically built this type definition around the uh, structure that gets returned back from the scraped products and you can actually see the schema in bright data as well and that's going to be something which i highly recommend you check out so We've got the product here that's looking pretty good and then we've got the results okay so now you can see that it's a results of type product so now i can safely map through it without ensure like you know without making a silly mistake or anything like that so in this case results import it from our components head over into my results results is expecting products array and then we can start styling this out so at this point i'm gonna have a uh, a grid layout okay so in this case we're gonna go ahead and say a grid uh, from the mobile view and then on a large screen we're going to say grid columns two and then on the extra large screen we're going to say grid columns five 
right? Oops, uh, extra movement grid columns five. And then we're gonna say a gap of five between all the cells and a width of four to apply, right? Now, once that's down, we are gonna map through the results, okay? So we're gonna say results.map. For every single result, what I wanna do is I wanna have a link, right? So this is a next link tag. Right. And then what I want to say is each one has a uh, result of its own. And the, the key here is going to be a title. Now, yes, you should really have something a bit more stronger than a title. But in this case, I'm just going to use it as a demo. But you should use something like the ASIN or the ID or something like that is a lot more better than just a title. Um, but it should be fine for this demo. Right. So I right. Oh, oh, my God. OK. Results dot URL is the one that is going to be the click through. And then I'm going to have a bit of a styling over here, right? So the styling is going to be a bit of flex box with a bit of shadow. It's quite a nice little style I've kind of created here. I just like that. <laughs> oh, nice. <laughs> Thank you, thank you, <laughs> thank you, Frank, so much. He goes another five dollar donation. Wait, can I grab? A, wait, I can grab a coffee with Sunny and Jay. Might have to jet over to Dubai, of course, man. If, you, if anyone's in Dubai, feel free to hit us up. Uh, that's what it's about. Like we honestly will meet up with anyone. That's cool, man. Uh, Dubai is the place to do it as well. So it's really, really nice to, to you know, let's make it happen. So. Once we have that in play, I'm actually going to go ahead and pop in an image as well. Now, this image is not going to be a Next.js image. It's going to be a normal image tag because I can't predict the URL that it's going to come from. That's why I'm doing it in that sense. Um, here, I'm going to just correct something like so. And look at that, guys. Boom. We have the images popping in already. Just what I'm talking about. I love it when it happens. I love it when it comes together, right? Look at that. Look. And we've also got the grid kicking in as well on the larger screen. Oh, just beautiful, beautiful stuff. It's like creme de la creme, right? Carson says, hey, Pop I'm here because of your amazing chat GPT clone tutorial, which was um, completely stunned by the UI. It was completely, uh, it was amazing. Keep up the good work. Thank you so much. I love and appreciate all of you. Honestly, we're almost at 700 likes. Let's keep going, right? So image tag is going strong. Now the div, right? So the next bit is a div. I'm going to have uh, the title. So it's just p two P tags. And I'm also collecting the number of reviews. So at this point, you can pretty much, you know, pause, follow along, that kind of thing. But this is just simple styling that I'm doing here, right? So I'm going to say that this div should basically be selfish. Take up all the room with flex one. Bit of padding. It should be a columnar, column, columnar. Okay, I'm not even going to try to say it again. <laughs> I messed up so bad. Then we've got the div. And then I've got two P tags. And I'm basically going to say if there was a previous price as well. So here, if there's a previous price and it's greater than zero, then it should show the previous price in dollars because that's what we're scraping for here from the US side. So as you can see here, if there is a dollar dollar version, you can see the previous price shows through. And we've simply got a line through on this on the uh, styling. Okay. Now for the um, class name here, I'm just going to do a flex, simple flex box. This one is going to also try and steal the space with a flex one, right? And as you can see, look, it's pretty, it's looking pretty good, right? This is pretty nice. Uh, those of you who haven't seen Last of Us, oh, amazing show, <laughs> proper random, but I just thought I should throw that in. Okay. Now after that, we have a the features, right? So some of these actually come back with features inside of them. So I'm going to go ahead and actually pop in a div like so and i'm gonna say result dot features dot map for every single feature <laughs> my voice is going for every single feature i'm gonna go ahead and map through the following i'm gonna say if there is a feature and it exists right then we're gonna go ahead and pop in like this feature with a p tag the key is gonna be the feature because you're mapping through of course and then it's gonna have a background indigo it's a little bit rounded off and it's got the feature in it right now as you can see look at that we, all, we automatically get the features in there now the only reason why that looks horrible is because the surrounding container of all of those features is not flex box right so we're gonna say flex wrap make sure that there's a gap between like of each like kind of thing inside there justify it to the end so it kind of sticks to the end because they're going to be quite small afterwards and give it a margin top of five now watch when i hit save watch when i hit save how beautiful this is look pow look at that oh just beautiful look at that oh my god nice that's what i'm talking about look at that right, i think i've actually done too many columns i think i've done grid column five when i was supposed to do grid columns three. Oh my god yeah i was thinking that i was like what the hell this is a bit big like grid, grid columns uh three yeah but you can really customize it however you want. That's better. I prefer this, right? And what's so nice is it has a clickable URL, okay? So if I was to click on this PlayStation 5, for example, look at that, guys. It actually takes me to the site that it was scraped off, which is sick, right? 
that is so cool i like loading the results this is so nice look at that oh just beautiful everything's there like it's so nice right three looks a lot more seamless i agree pat picture right so look at that that it goes into like from one two three right really nice right and obviously at the top here i need to give a little bit of padding but we can fix that that's fine right so james says bam nice that's what i'm talking about dude right so now what i want to do is i want to pull in the uh rest of the results over here so this is looking very good like the scraper is working if i zoom out you see how it's centering in on the max width element all this good stuff um yeah amazing stuff mark says i'm trying finishing up your project but i'm still getting stuck remember you are going to get stuck guys it's normal right it's debugging is part of the process this is why we have a community like zero to full stack hero coaching calls community because that the whole point is that you're not alone and you can debug it with other people in the coaching calls so feel free to check it out but otherwise remember it's just perseverance it's practice you should see how much i get stuck right we are almost at 700 likes we're about to break the mark let's keep going final stretch people let's go so let's um get the a little bit of padding over there i'm not liking how that's looking so <clears throat> i want to uh actually get the i believe it's the header um probably where i haven't given the style correctly yet so i believe it's in the header um where I haven't given it a little bit of the correct styling. I think maybe it's in the layout, right? So for the layout, I mean, you could really add this fix in anywhere, to be honest with you. We can add it in here, to be honest, where's my header? To be honest, I'm just gonna add it in here. I'm gonna say, where's my, let's do a padding, search results. You know what, let's, we'll do it where the search results are. Let's go to results. Um, search results it was in the page dot search there you go search results for here and i'm gonna simply say over here that's it it was in this file this is what i forgot yeah padding on the y-axis of five bam that's just look at it's just little things like that make a huge difference in my opinion all right so that's looking a lot cleaner already nice um let's type in like xbox one hit search and this should take it should take us to a new xbox screen and we'll add the spinners in at the end like finishing touches like the spinners and all that good stuff we'll add in right at the end um i think that's still still searching uh or yeah probably is yeah there you go um that's why i'm going to add in eventually at react hot toast notifications as well but for now while that's happening let's go ahead and do the sidebar magic okay so sidebar see you see here we had sidebar rows now that we have data in Firestore, we can actually complete that, right? So on the side uh, side side view, we need to go ahead and get the collection of all of those things inside of the database. So all of these basically are going to be in the sidebar, right? So use collection is great. We are going to make this a client side component because we're going to have a live listener. So use a client. You can, again, use it in a more granular fashion. Um, that's completely your call. Now, at this point, we're going to go ahead and pop this in. So I'm going to say const snapshot use collection, and I am going to order it by the start ETA. OK, so in this case, let's do query and I'm going to go ahead and pop in this one. So I'm going to query. I'm going to grab the collection, which is from Firestore. The database is from our local Firebase file and then order by is how we query the data. Right. And if you really want to think about this in a simple form, oh, look at that, guys. Look at that. That actually just happened perfectly as it worked out. Oh, my God. That's just okay, more could I want. Like the way when it works like that, it's just so sick. Like, oh, I love it. See the real time fashion there. Remember what I talked about this architecture, right? You don't even have to care about everything. It just has a real time listener there. When it was ready, after the webhook, all, after all this flow happened and it hit and it updated Firebase, because there was a real time connection, the client just showed the results. Beautiful, beautiful. Just mm, nice, right? That's what I'm talking about. So in this case, you can just do the uh, collection like so. But if you want to order it and query, you know, like actually kind of, you know, structure the data on the server side, then kind of throw in. Then what you do is you add a query, wrap everything, and then add an order by, right? So I'm going to start by descending to show the most stuff at the top, okay? Um, my AC is freezing right now. <laughs> I'm actually freezing. Um, so at this point, uh, for the unordered list, what I'm going to do is I'm going to say it's going to be a flex list. I'm going to do flex column, and I'm going to have a scrollable element over here. So flex column gap two, py two. Oh, 
Mike Torres says, saying saying a long time no see. What is up, dude? Just got up in the US and excited to do this build. Being a part of the Pop Fam has literally changed my career. Boom, that's what I'm talking about. And with that 700 likes, thank you for the donation. Jay, screenshot that. Absolutely incredible things uh, being said by the Pop Fam right now. Man, I, I, the commu I'm so proud of this community. I swear to God, it's like a family of developers and it's just untouchable. Uh, you guys are incredible. Thank you for sharing your stories and continuing to share them with me. Uh, and I'm so grateful that I am in the position to be able to teach you guys. All right, we're going to go ahead and map through the snapshot, which is going to come back from uh, what we just set up. And here, what I'm going to do is I'm basically going to go ahead and map over something like a sidebar row, like I kind of showed you there. Obviously, we don't have it uh, built yet, but remember, you should be passing in a key every time you map. That's going to be the document ID. And then we're going to pass the document through just like so. Right? So instead of this now, we are now going to go ahead and create a sidebar row component. So uh, inside of our components folder, we're going to go ahead and do sidebar row.tsx rfce boom just like so get rid of that and then inside of here we are going to expect a component coming in so <clears throat> let's go ahead and pop that in right now so we are expecting a document i actually really like this track all right this is actually quite nice like it's kind of peaceful calming all right this is going to be props jay make sure you screenshot that that is actually awesome to to keep track of all right type props there we go and then what we're going to do is the document data we can actually pull from firestore and that will resemble the data that has actually been passed over right so use client is what we're going to do here because we actually are going to have some things like a use state and that kind of thing to show which is active and so forth thank you jay for the update All right so at this point now i'm going to have a list item because remember it's actually parent of this is when we actually showed it out was inside of if you remember clearly where is it sidebar if you remember clearly over here and we can also import that right now so let's go ahead and pull that in the parent is the unordered list so that way inside it's a list mr franco's papa fam is strong yo frank's on one today thank you so much dude another donation <laughs> i'm gonna get sushi tonight that's the goal um so yeah, as you can see look the sidebar rows are flying in that's what i'm talking about right that's what i wanted to see um i'm gonna have a router which is basically every time i click on any of these links you can actually do it a few ways you can actually instead of a list item here you can have a next link but it will prefetch as well so prefetching would be great but sometimes prefetching can be a bit excessive in my opinion as well um but you can actually deactivate the prefetch so yeah you could use a link here as well uh, but just worth a good thought right so const router equals use router use router 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 is it router router and don't do what i just did right take your time with that next four slash navigation right don't make that same mistake right um hamza says hi what's up dude uh, i'm also going to use something called a path name right because i'm going to need the path name to do a quick little comparison check afterwards so use path name so let's go ahead and pull this in like so uh, I'm just going to go ahead and do it because my auto complete is being so slow right now. Um, and then I'm going to pop that in. So it's going to be part of the import. There we go. Right. Hit save. That's great. So at this part for the um, document here, I'm going to have a div. Uh, okay. So I hate it when my code and my editor doesn't work with me like I should. Sometimes, again, when you're live, this stuff just tends to happen, right? So um, I have to sometimes bloody code in such a slow way. There we go. All right. So we have the list element. I'm going to say the key. We don't actually need the key because I'm rendering it out on the other side. We've got the click on click. And on here, we're going to push through. And we're doing forward slash the document ID. And that means when I click on any of these list elements, it's actually going to go ahead and pop in the uh, send me to the correct URL. All right. The next thing I want to do is i'm actually going to go ahead and say that if it was um <clears throat> i'm actually going to have, first you have the search term so i'm going to have the p tag saying here the search term so like that for example xbox ps5 and so forth i'm going to style this so it looks way nicer because right now it looks horrible um 
and I'm actually going to do an active little check. So before we start this, I need to see if this is the current active one, right? So basically the way we can do this is we already have the access to this and we have this information over here as well. So all I need to do is basically check if the ID of this, which I have in the document object, so the doc object, if the ID of that is actually found in the current path name, we can determine if it's active at the moment. And the way we simply do this is we have a use effect, right? We have a use effect, a use effect like this uh, is written like this with a dependency array if you don't know how to use use effect make sure you check out my use effect tutorial if you're watching the replay it'll be linked up somewhere around here afterwards thank you jay <laughs> adding that in um so yeah we're gonna throw that in i've got something in my eye. um so before we carry on we're gonna need a piece of state so the state is gonna represent the active if it's true or if it's not active or not so in this case active use state like so we're gonna start that off with a value of false right and then what we're going to say is if there is no path name simply return otherwise we're going to set active and we're basically going to say if the path name includes the document id right and so what this will do is it will set the uh, uh it will set this variable true for the individual item which is active so that way your active will only be will only your active piece of state will only be true for the component the sidebar row component which is uh matching the current route that you're actually on so in that way you know it'll make sense in a second i promise you i've completely fudged that um one jovi says i just wanted to thank you for your content i'm 20 years old and got a job as a flutter react dev and i'm going over your next source crash course at the moment that's incredible dude thank you for sharing that information um I keep, good luck with your journey man and then here what we're going to do is we're going to have a class name bit of styling but notice what i've done here i've done jsx so the squiggly brackets with a back tick for string interpolation and i've gone ahead and added in a, a conditional so i've said if it's active then add a background white and a shadow of md right so now you can see look at that guys boom so as you can see if I click on the MacBook Pro, for example, some of these were stuck, remember? So some of them were actually like stuck at the moment, but this one right now isn't actually changing the rendering state. So I need to check out what's actually going on with that. If I was to go ahead and click on that, is it changing the actual route? Yeah, so it was. So it wasn't loading the page. Oh yeah, okay. So big, big thing. Right. do not make this mistake as well if you're using the variable you have to include it in the dependency array otherwise what just happened on the screen will happen to you All right so now if i hit refresh you'll see a load results if i click xbox one ps5 look at that that's better nice yeah so that's how we have the active state All right so that's great amazing stuff and now i'm also going to say if the status is pending it's going to say scraping the information okay so scraping information will be there so some of them were stuck before which is completely fine i ended up canceling them anyway which is fine um that can happen it's completely normal with scrapers uh sometimes it could be loads of situations you know amazon could have picked up uh, a scraper could have gone into edge case uh, you know you, your scraper is only as good as you programming it uh, so in that case, most likely my fault. <laughs> All right, so there we go. Um, so we're going to click on, and then we're also going to have a span tag. And for this span, I'm just simply going to have an icon, right? Now, this icon is going to be a tick if the status is complete. Otherwise, it will be a spinner, which is going to be pending. Now, the spinner that I'm going to be using is actually from a lovely library called React Spin Kit. So we're going to install that right now, React Spin Kit because we're going to start implementing this, right? So React Spin Kit over here. Let's go ahead and pop that in. So we're going to go ahead and do that over here. So npm install React Spin Kit. I don't need to do npm install. I'm going to do yarn in the front end. So we're going to say, oops, what the hell is that? Okay, get rid of that. Oh, God damn it. No, yeah, there we go. Uh, yarn, add, boom, React Spin Kit. And then I'm going to import my Spin Kit like so. Pop that in here. You want to add spin kit and then as you can see this sometimes pops up right if this pops up we have to add in the types and you're using yarn just do yarn add capital d for developer install types react spin kit otherwise just copy the one that they gave you for npm and that will get rid of that little error for you so you won't see that complaint anymore there you go it's gone and then what you want to do is simply add in a status pending check over here which we've already done sorry i've got completely missed out so now i'm going to say if it's pending it's going to have a spinner show 
Otherwise, it's going to show a circle check icon, which is going to be a solid variant. Okay. Now you can go to the React Spin Kit website. They show you a bunch of different examples here for different spinners, all that kind of stuff. Fade in none means it shows straight away and you can set a color for it as well. All right. So again, you can just play around with this as much as you want, but I'm going to be a margin left of two, just to give a basic bit of styling. And then for this overall div over here, I'm going to give this a flex, flex column, justify it on the center axis, right? So let's go back over to our application. Oh, yes, look at that. That's what I'm talking about. Um, look at that scrape. Oh, it looks good. All right. So the ones that are scraping are there. And again, those are pretty much dead links because I cut them off halfway. So what we can actually do to keep it very clean is I'm going to delete all of my scrapers right now. Uh, so my scraping instances and as you can see this will delete from there as well so now we should have nothing here so if i type in something like playstation 5 hit enter we should see as it gets entered in like scraping information nice so i'm going to leave that on the side right now and as that goes ahead and gets ready that will turn to a tick once it's finished and the results will load in dynamically okay so things like that just beautiful to see whenever you delete everything by the way you are going to see have to re reload it once just once so that way it goes ahead and, and pops in here right but as you can see here if i was to make this bigger you see that's looking pretty good guys i like it i like it very much okay so scraping results from amazon let's go ahead and improve the ui on that as well so i think for that sense we're actually done oh another donation Hey, Sunny Big Fan, waiting for more of three bills. Yes, we have a lot more coming in. So don't worry, lots and lots of content to come your way. Um, so once that's, uh, let that do its thing. We're going to go into, where is it? I've got so many random things running right now. Yeah, there we go. So you see that scraping. Um, cancel that. Where's my, and what I love about this, remember, it doesn't matter if you go away from the app, just like I did now. You see how it just picked up on it, right? So that's pretty cool and then there you go scraping all right so what else do i need to do to be honest with you oh there we go boom look at that playstation 5 scraper done looks clean that's what i'm talking about oh so nice all right um you can obviously adjust this as much as you need to uh for this we actually don't want the uh, x-axis there i don't know why there's such big padding here to be honest with you but if we go to sidebar we can fix that so overflow Y, overflow X should be, um, that's why we're seeing that. Okay. So inside of my sidebar, we can go ahead and do a scroll auto. All right. So that's happening because of that slight overhang there. Um, <clears throat> I was using the new routing system, yes, until I just changed something last second. Um, but for this part right here, uh, it's, it's because it's overhanging a like, little bit. Um, all right. Let's do flex wrap. Um, no, that's not here. Flex wrap. Um, so I don't want to kind of, kind of don't want it to overflow here. There we go. So here... You can fix it a bunch of different ways. I'm trying to just think how I want to do it myself. Let's do for the sidebar row. Let's kind of condense it, I guess. We can do it. You can honestly mess around with this as much as you want. Um, here I can make it even on a small screen, this padding of one on a medium screen and above padding of, you know, I don't, I, I personally don't like getting it too small to be honest. Um, but yeah, to be honest, what you can do, which might look really good, is you can make these two elements actually flex column on a small screen and then flex row on a medium screen and above. That will sort of correct this a little bit. There you go. You could do that. Um, and then it will go into the full screen when you do it there, that way. Yeah, you can kind of, you can mess around with it. Honestly, I'm not going to go too crazy with it. Um, but yeah, feel free to, to sort of play around with this as much as you want. Uh, and if you want to kind of change the order of that as well, I'll show you a little trick. You can actually make it so you can say the order minus two, for example. And you see how it goes to the top? So I can make it like that, for example, for that. And I can make it order one for medium screens and above. So now it doesn't break the sort of screen size on that one, but it still, yeah, it still gets it right. That's it's still, still pretty good. And then you can add a gap of like two between them and just little things like that. It's kind of cool, 
right margin left to two we probably don't need here to be honest with you we can kind of leave, leave it to do its thing i'm not a fan of why this is touching though my padding is all messed up and stuff to be honest with you this is like minor details you can actually go ahead and adjust this so you can actually inspect and see that there's just too much padding there to be honest with you so here you can kind of manipulate that as much as you want here you can manipulate that reduce your padding if you don't want it to move on, like use as much space and all that kind of stuff so i'm going to leave that in your hands that's kind of you know up to you how you want to kind of do that um and plus i have the finish code for the actual full scraper uh available over on that demo in my proper github repo right so in the proper github repo right now you've got this version right here um so yeah this is what it should be I've kind of screwed up my styling to be honest with you let's just do another example here with the xbox one let's go nearly uh tell me is pretty tight yeah it's so cool honestly Someone says water break. I will actually do that in a second. Um, there we go. So, I mean, it's looking pretty good. Yeah. So that's pretty. Oh, there you go. There you go. So just an update for some reason. That's a lot better. Yeah. So scraping uh, results from Amazon. I actually want this to look a little bit cleaner as well. So I want to have my results. <coughs> so pay <coughs> on this ID page. Sorry. I definitely need a water break. Uh, I'm going to add a spinner in and a delete button so yes we are actually going to add delete functionality as well so where we've got the pending here so i'm going to add a scraper in like so uh spinner sorry um the spinner i'm going to pop in like here the delete button is actually fairly straightforward to be honest with you the delete button what we're going to essentially have is a handle delete function which is going to go ahead and call so i'm going to create a handle delete function like so this handle delete function simply uses the delete doc function. We need a router to go ahead and activate that. So to be able to do what I need to do. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and pop in a router like so. Pop in the router with next navigation. And then we're simply going to call this from a component. Now I'm going to create a reusable little snippet of JSX here. So rather than having the same bit of code in a few different places, I'm going to have a delete button, which is simply a button in a uh, like a JSX block, and it's gonna have the handle delete attached to the on click function. And then we just render this where I need it. So down under here, I'm gonna have the delete button. And also I'm gonna have the delete button uh, underneath my div over here, right? So I'm gonna have a div a delete button as well. Right now, you can see here we've got a delete button. So if I was to go ahead and do this, pow, it's gone. Uh, PlayStation 5, let's just do something like uh, da -da -da, MacBook. Uh, MacBook Pro just seems to be a bit weird. Let's just do something like Hello World. All right, Hello World. And again, that will pop up in a second. So you know, it's scraping. Really nice. Honestly, pretty slick. My right, animations and stuff. Right, everything looks pretty good. Um, that will go ahead and pop in. So you see the delete works. It deletes from it as we needed it to. Um, now what I want to do is go ahead and get react hot toast notifications in the correct way right so react hot toast notifications is the next step so react hot toast notifications I'm trying to think i feel like i'm missing something really important now but i think we're actually near the end of this build so i'm going to add in the react hot notif these are basically for these so i'm going to say like you know when it, we've got the different parts happening I actually am a big fan of these. I love it. So I'm going to do yarn add React Hot Toast. I'm going to show you how to implement it inside of Next.js 13. So that way you can, you know, make sure you use it in the correct way. Let's go ahead and pop this back over there. So cool. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and do yarn add React Hot Toast. Oh, there we go. Look at that. Boom. <laughs> so nice. All right. So hello world, PlayStation 5. You see, we can click between them and it works. Awesome stuff. All right. That's looking great. Now here, what I want to do is I want to, we've already installed the React Hotness notification. Um, for the actually installing that, what they ask you to do is they ask you to essentially just add it at the top level. Now you can't do this because it's a client side component, which means that we actually have to do a little bit of a, a step, right? We have to have something called a client provider. Now I'm going to show you how to do this inside of Next.js 13 and, and fix this pattern. So in the layout.tsx, what we do, is we create something called a client provider, right? So essentially what a client provider is, is we are gonna wrap our app with it, right? So essentially it's gonna look something like this, client 
provider boom and then we're going to basically pop this around our app okay something like that and then i'm going to create a client provider component so client provider tsx like so rfce and then i'm going to go ahead and basically uh replace the signature so the top part this part with this so what we're saying here is essentially it just takes children as a prop the children type is of a react nodes so basically it's just saying it can wrap a few things then it's going to be a fragment so we don't want it to affect any styling so i basically want it to be like an invisible fragment that's just a wrapper and then i'm going to add in the toaster Right, so this is where you can add in all of the things like, you know, if you had like Redux or any of that stuff and then render the children around it, right? And then what you can say is that this should use a client, right? Now what you're essentially doing is you're like, even this works really well for like React context and all that good stuff as well. So now if I show you the layout, right? So here, for example, and I import my client provider, you see, all of these things are still being rendered in. Um, return type is void. It's not a JSX element. Um, so I've got a little silly mistake here. Why is that? Um, let's have a look. So export default function, toaster, child, client provider, components, client provider. Um, let's have a look. Client provider. Okay, so I made a silly mistake here. So what have I got? Export default function client provider. Okay, so I'm gonna slowly go ahead and just check what I've not done correctly. So that's the same. My signature is the same. Oh god damn it! I'm not returning. Yes, Rayan, thank you so much. I need to return. Yeah, so I'm, oh, this is a silly mistake. Don't do that. All right, so I'm re you need to return. That's why. Okay, then we don't have the error. So now what we're doing is these will still actually render as server components inside. That's completely good. Uh, it's fine. But now you can actually wrap your app with things that you might need to uh, have like client stuff for, right? So like client um, interaction with. So now you can see that's looking pretty good. I'm, something's bothering me with that. That's not looking the way I want it to look, but it's fine for now. Oh, God, uh, my LCD kicks in. Um, Little bits of padding are off, but check out the propagator repo if you really want to get it nailed in. That's fine. All right, now let's get the toaster notification added in. So, reason why toasters are really important is it's more of a UI UX perspective. You want the user to understand that something is happening when they click it, right? So that's my reasoning for this. Um, so we're gonna go to the header.tsx over here. Yep, and we're gonna go into this, and right here is where we want it to happen. So. Inside of my header.tsx, what I'm going to do is I'm going to say that we're going to basically create a notification at the top here. So this is going to be right at the top here. So da -da -da, we're going to say toast dot toast loading. So here. So what we're doing is this will actually make a toaster pop up and it's going to say starting a scraper for the whatever input you put in. And then we get a reference to it. That's what we get returned back. OK, now at this point, what we can do is we can actually go ahead and either trigger a success and replace that toaster or we can trigger a failure and replace that toaster with whatever happens. Right. So what I'm going to do is on the error, it's very easy. I just simply go into the catch block and I say, uh, replace the this ID toaster so we pass in our notification reference whoops something went wrong very easy okay same for the uh, response so over here once it's gone ahead and we get the collection so once we basically put it in a pending state and if we, we know that it's working we then say scraper started successfully so now the user knows exactly what's happening on their side of the, the the page right so let's see if it works so let's go ahead and type in something like testing Hit this, starting a scraper for testing. And as you can see, boom. Oh, nice. Like it's starting scraping results from Amazon. And now you can see. It. And what I love about this, guys, is you can actually just go ahead and pre like literally start as many as you want. So we can say Xbox One, 
right? Starting a scrape effects one. And again, what's so beautiful about this, I can refresh the page. I can go away from this. I can, you know, do whatever I want to do because these are not dependent on me being there. These are dependent on this architecture happening, which means that even if the client was to completely disconnect, this is still going to happen. And it's still going to populate the database, which means when the client comes back and reestablishes the connection, it's still going to go ahead and paint out the most up-to-date relevant information, right? So once Firebase has been updated, that real-time connection is all that needs for the client to then pick it up, right? So as you can see, this will just pop in when they're ready. So this is clean. This is nice, right? And let me know right now if you enjoy that and you think that that is, oh, that is clean, right? Um, so that's kind of done. And as you'll see, like shortly, once those scrapers are finished, they will just simply pop up with little ticks and they'll do their thing, right? And this is what you kind of want with something that could be a bit more time consuming or like, uh, like in any essence, you want your UI to represent or clearly show the user what is happening. So that way they understand that, okay, I, you know, I'm not just sitting here thinking nothing's happening. It's actually doing something behind the scenes now. Okay. So <clears throat> at this point, I think we are basically done. I had in my head something that needed to be done that I've completely, just completely forgotten about, but uh, it needs to be done. And what was it? It was, let's have a look at this build and let's have a look at my build that was finished here. So... This is all done. Right, we'll this is done. Um, I think it's good. Joe says, Sunny, my big man, what's up, man? And this, is anyone working on the next new app directory? Yes, this is the new app directory uh, right now that we're using. Um, okay, I think what we're going to do is we're going to deploy, firstly, uh, the. We're going to deploy our back end, right? So, first things first, let's deploy this back end. So, Right now, we're using Ngrok, which is a temporary development solution, right? I don't want to do that. I want to use a permanent backend. So in this case, I'm going to go ahead and, well, if I cut it right now, it's going to kind of ru ruin this flow. So what I can do is I can start another terminal here and do the following. I can say um, Firebase deploy um, uh, dash dash only functions. And what this will do is it will go ahead and it will build my application. So it will build this out and then it will deploy my function to the cloud. So let's go ahead and see if that works. So you can see deploying, running command. It does a build. It does a TypeScript check to see if everything's right. And then this will go ahead and run the build scripts. So now what this is doing is it will enable any APIs that need to be enabled. And then it will begin the deployment process and it will give us back a URL. Can anyone guess what the next step is, right? Once we've gone ahead and got this back, we need to replace it as the webhook URL. Remember, right now, this, this URL that we're using right here is the one that we're ngrocked, right? So it's our local host. We ngrocked it through a tunnel and then we're using that one. So if the minute I disconnect my ngrock, it's going to die my webhook, right? We don't want that to happen. We want to have a permanent one. Um, function deploy had errors. No. Okay, something went wrong. Let's have a look. What happened? So, failed to create function, da da da. Failed to create function. Function deploy had errors with the following functions. Okay. Um, can it tell me what the error was or not? Unscraper complete. Okay, let's try again. <laughs> And uh, okay, so these are running. If we check our build at the back, oh, there you go. I was still doing it. So uh, you can always double check the progress. Right now, I have a few overhanging ones. So I'm going to do. I'm just going to do a little bit of a cleanup operation right now, just to kind of make things a bit cleaner. I'm going to cancel them manually, and then uh, do things because right now, where I've been overloading it, I think I've kind of screwed something up. That's my that's my fault, to be honest with you. So in this case, let's go over to, I'm going to just do a little bit of a cleanup right now. Two seconds. There we go. Okay. Awesome. So at this point, what we can do is go over to my deployment. So we've got an error with our deployment. So check the Firebase debug log. Let's have a look what's going on. 
so what's the issue here? There is an error deploying functions. 403, unable to retrieve bright data. Ensure the cloud function service counts off at additional permissions. You can add the permissions by granting the row registry reader. Right. Failed to create function on script complete. Unable to retrieve the metadata for the location. Ensure the cloud service counts. Permission denied. Okay. So that's a first. I have not seen that one before. Variant variables. So I've got my key that gets passed through. My Firebase config got passed through. Um, oh, we have fire. Oh, 750 likes. Let's go, guys. So I've got forbidden error. This is interesting. Um, right there, YouTube build backend. Let's have a look. Let's go into our Firebase and see what's happening. So functions right let's see five is tools five is init five is deploy which is fine all right so i didn't run into this the first time i think honestly my demo gods are just against me right now but you will be able to deploy this i promise you will be able to deploy this um i've done this literally build a few times i even did it live on a coaching call and i didn't run into this so i think it's just a bit of a one-off issue right now but <clears throat> so let's just have another look so we've got micro network task da, da, da. hbr i never treatment let's go ahead and just see what that's about i've never seen that actually before to be honest with you so no idea what that is let's see if we can google it see what's happening okay yeah so that's this bit of an open problem enable in the google cloud i think to be honest with you something wasn't enabled properly that's what i have a feeling artifact registry including enable go to project selector let's have a look Google Cloud Console. Let's have a look. I need to find that one. So uh, this is not this one. I need to go to here. Right data build. So this is interesting because I don't have the build that I just created. This is not the oh access four hours ago. Yeah, this is not the one. This is not the this is not the cloud function that I had set up. So. This is interesting. So right now, this is probably why I'm experiencing this issue because it hasn't actually set it up correctly, I don't think. Let's have a look. So, do, do, do. Uh, I'm going to try something cheeky here. I don't think it's going to work, but uh, that's going to change the URL. I'm not forget. Let's try one more time. If it doesn't work, that's all good. Um, we can figure it out. So... I don't think it turned it. See, required API is enabled, so it has done it. I'm not quite sure why that's um issue being an issue right now. And yes, I completely agree with you guys. So we've got a thing here saying, uh, a comment saying, there are many dependencies in the project that things to get updated and change always new bugs. 100%. This happens a lot, and this is completely normal. Yeah, so don't freak out if you run into errors, bugs. Like this happens to me like a billion times a day. Trust me, it's completely normal. This is this is a completely normal thing to be happening. Um, what I would recommend is you go ahead and uh, definitely the GitHub repo has perfect code in it. Um, so you can definitely check that out if you want to. I will show you how to deploy to Vercel as well. So let's go ahead and do that as well right now. So while that's trying to deploy, I think this might work now to be honest with you. Uh, I think it just hadn't activated a correct thing on its side but while that's happening let's deploy the cell right so while this app is pretty much in its ready state we're going to go ahead and do the cell so all you need to do is install the Vercel cli tools and i highly recommend you check out my video on youtube about how to deploy any next.js app from the Vercel cli it's going to be linked over here in the description what the hell oh my god jay did you see what is that is that 150 dollars because i'm a big fan of you from taiwan 
My friend liked anime. May I provide the web next you built as a gift for him? We love you. May I provide the web next you built for him? Uh, I, I'm not sure what you mean, but thank you so much. That's crazy, dude. NT150. Uh, that's huge. Thank you so much for the donation. Man, crazy. Oh, there we go. Guys, it worked. So it was just a delay. Okay, thank God. I was thinking in my head, I just, I didn't know idea what was happening, right? So look at that. There we go. It did work. It did work, right? So it just took a little bit of patience for it to activate. And the reason why I knew it, because it said required API, this one exactly is enabled. So it just took a little bit of time to propagate, I guess. But what you want to do is grab that URL, right? The deployed URL, head over to your bright data. So let's go to bright data right now. Like here, yep. And then I want you to go to your delivery preferences. Um, pop in your brand new, foot. and this one is always live, remember? So this is the missing piece of the puzzle here. So now we've got our complete webhook, which is always live. Awesome stuff. Let's go ahead and click update. Yes, yes, that's perfect. Update. Nice, that's done. And now what we can do is we can go to statistics. I believe, yeah, I canceled a lot of these that are running because um, we were testing a few things out quite heavily. Uh, now that's good. What I want to do is, Sunny is fast in Firebase. <laughs> so now I want to deploy this to Vercel. That's the next step. So naturally, this has got environment variables, right? So we've got a key here and so forth. Yes, I'm showing it. I don't care for now. All right, so I'm going to do, I'm going to invalidate it anyway. So I'm going to go ahead and copy this key just for reference, right? And I'm going to type in Vercel. Vercel, that's all I'm typing in. It's easy. Set up and deploy. Yep. So click enter. Which scope do you want to deploy to? I'm logged into Vercel, so I'm actually going to go ahead and do it. And by the way, guys, if you if you are going to sign up to Vercel, please definitely check out the second link in the description. It is a Vercel affiliate link. So if you sign up with that link, it will actually support the Papa fam whenever you decide to go to a pro member on Vercel. So it would really mean the world if you actually use the second link in the description to sign up to Vercel. It's literally the same as you doing it any other way, but it just supports the Papa fam. So I appreciate it if you do. Second link in the description for when you sign up with Vercel. Yeah. So go ahead and do this. Link to an existing project. Nope. We're going to do a new one. What's your project name? I'm happy with the default. Code is located in this directory, correct? And this will actually um, bug out at this point. The reason why is it will work here. So one more, nope, it don't want to modify these settings. So it will deploy, right? So here I want you to click on inspect, control click, open. Now at this point, you're, you haven't got your environment variable set up, right? So what I want you to do is go into your environment uh, local file, grab this, copy, paste it, and then Go over here to your da, 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 your bright data scraper. Go to settings and go to environment variables and paste here. So command V and now you've got your paste. Go to production, preview, development, whatever environment you're doing. I'm just going to push to all, save. And then what I want you to do is go back to your code. <clears throat> I want you to control C, cut the build. Okay. In fact, just to ensure that you've actually cut it, go to deployments and you'll see it's still running. You can cancel that deployment because that hasn't got the environment variable, which means it's going to die on you. And you can do it from the uh, CLI. I have actually shown you that as well. Okay. Um, thank you so much um, for dropping that in the, the link in the description. All right. So now we're going to go ahead and do um, Vercel again. So Vercel, and that will actually go ahead and redeploy. And the reason why I actually do recommend you do it through the CLI um, there's two approaches. You can do it. For, I would recommend you do connect it to GitHub because that way you're one, you're pushing your code to GitHub. Then it's going to go ahead and make sure it does it. Like it will redeploy every time you push, which is kind of clean. It's like a CI approach. Um, but this is actually also cool when you deploy with the Vercel CLI. It's very quick, right? Um, and you can actually do Vercel environment pull, pull the environment variables down, that kind of stuff, which helps out in the team sense, right? Joel says, dumb boss. I appreciate you guys. Thank you so much. Remember, make sure you definitely use that Vercel link. Second link in the description helps us out. I uh, appreciate it. Yeah. Um, so in this case, and if you even if you have an account right now, just click on that link and go through it. <laughs> it will help the pop farm. I, I'm just being open with you. All right. Um, it's an awesome new program they've launched. So in this case, this will build out the deployment. So in this case, uh, oh, um, it depends. Ugh. All right. So let that do its thing. Now, what's going to happen is... This will deploy. We have now set up our Bright Data backend to have a delivery preference 
towards the brand new webhook. So essentially now we're deploying our client to production. So that way it's going to be on a real URL. Bright data is all set up, it's working. We have our API key and we'll be able to push requests from the new deployed client to our Bright Data platform. That's going to then hit our fun cloud function, which is deployed on Firebase, which will hit our Firebase database. And then this will have a real-time connection with our client, whoever is checking in. And yeah, you'll be able to see your stuff, okay? So let's go ahead and see for ourselves once this is deployed. But if this is done, guys, I want to like, just finish strong and finish with 800 likes at least. And if you're watching the replay right now, get this video over a thousand and just keep on going. All right. So this is ready. Let's go ahead and see. So Amazon Web Scraper. Let's go ahead and see. And do I see? Okay. Awesome. I see Hello World. I see PlayStation 5. And as you can see, I can click into that and you can see I see my URL or some stuff. Let's go ahead and type in something like uh, testing and starting a scraper for testing. Oh, nice, nice, nice. And there we go. Scraping information from Amazon. All right, that's good. That's good. Uh, let's go ahead and get the music up. Let me see what the music's about. Uh, I need some upbeat stuff. Where's my... This is pretty good to be honest. Yeah. North Korean says, thank you, full and complete soon. Wonderful video, congratulations, thank you so much. Um, Sojdev says, hello, Pop Fam, it's uh, me, Somek from Poland. What's up? Glad to see you're here, and finally, I can learn more with you. Awesome stuff, thank you for joining in as well. Um, let's see if that actually activated what we wanted it to activate. So, over on Bright Data, let's go into our scraper statistics. And you can see it's begun scraping. It found the records, guys. It found the records. This will populate in just a second. If it does, oh my God, this, we're going to lose our mind right now. Oh, this means that we're going to also test our webhook because that means it worked, but the webhook is about to get hit as well. Right? So this will hit the webhook once it's done. So it's finalizing the call. Someone just went ahead and did Xbox. Okay, so oh, damn it. Oh, damn it. Now everyone's going to go on this bloody thing. All right so someone's gonna start scraping oh god i hope it don't come up bad i'm gonna i'm gonna try and hide it if someone does anything don't use that link please just one second okay <laughs> i'm gonna have to re invalidate my key but let's see but that is found it just needs to wrap up the webhook call and then these will pop in and it will get done rohan wandre says much needed thank you sonny i appreciate you thank you for tuning in bro and in this case it's just taking a little time to wrap up sometimes this can happen with webhooks it can actually take a little bit of time sometimes for it to actually go ahead and kick in but the benefit is that you're actually guaranteed that it's going to go ahead and do it right so while this is doing its thing it's actually found the records already so it just needs to go ahead and deploy it to be honest with you it could be a problem with my um you are oh no 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 it did it it did it oh there we go that's what i'm talking about yes guys it did it that is incredible see the top one done it found the video the second one's done as well it's just wrapping up the the, the job that it's 100 done it's found it it's, that will hit the webhooks shortly and that will be done as well amazing stuff crazy absolutely crazy i can see people chucking in things right now so i'm gonna go ahead and just uh be careful with that now <laughs> so i'm gonna go ahead and show the original deployment um, because i can see people are starting to scrape um, and i just don't trust you guys to be honest with you uh when, when i'm live so i'm gonna show you the final build in all of its glory but that was absolutely incredible guys that we actually i showed you how to go ahead and create a fully functional web scraper deploy everything so this is the first one that i actually showed you with it's a local version so it's safe all right um this is crazy patty says the feeling when the build is working well i know it's crazy so as you can see the scrapes from amazon we're able to delete we're able to create new ones we have react hot toast notifications you guys learn how to interact with webhooks you learn how to deploy your own cloud functions you learn how to use nextjs 13.2 and yes we will conquer the new root.ts file structure i tried to do it live right now but i didn't want to spend too long and make this video tedious for anyone who's watching it back so i will conquer it i'll make a video on it you guys will learn it and we'll make some more banger videos as always and remember if you aren't already and you haven't already checked it out make sure you sign up to bright data use the link in the description the first link gets you 15 dollars free credits which is more than enough to get this build done to get loads of stuff happening we are five likes away from 800 let's smash that before we go ahead remember this is an amazing award-winning proxy networks 
powerful, powerful web scrapers. The code for the web scraper, web scraper starter template for Amazon is the third link in the description. So don't forget to check that out, right? And remember, if you are finding any of this stuff quite tricky or you know you want to get really ahead of the game with your coding knowledge, feel free to check us out at papareact.com forward slash course and join the Zero to Full Stack Career. We have incredible members. Just give this video a watch. You'll feel the love. I promise you that. Like Even if you don't decide to join, just fill it out. It's, it's honestly more than a course. It's a, it's a huge community of and a family of developers. And we are upgrading this left, right, and center. It's become incredible lately. So go ahead, check it out on the website. The link is in the description. And uh, yeah, I do massively appreciate every single one of you. So thank you so much again for tuning in. And uh, I'm just trying to find uh, my last bit of information I was trying to pull on the screen right now. Where is it? Wait, where have I gone? Oh, yeah, there we go. I can show this. Yeah. So, yeah, final summary. We have Bright Data, which is pulling from Amazon in this demo. So we literally were able to pull from this. And remember, just, just understand the significance of what it's actually doing. To be able to harness a huge network of proxies and IPs in this way, literally by passing in interaction code, passing code, it wasn't that difficult to get that up. Right? And that was a very simple example. You can combine information from different websites, have webhooks in for interacting, have your own cloud function pinging. All this stuff can happen and it has loads of things like it automatically retries if the scrape fails. So this is, it's, remember, this is more of a, a, a realistic use case and you can do some really powerful things with this technology. So definitely worth checking them out, right? So make sure you definitely do check out Bright Data um i can't recommend them enough it's been awesome working with them as well and as you saw today it's incredibly useful let me know if you want to see more content with bright data they have awesome new products as well and we are going to be covering them in the upcoming videos so definitely stay tuned without further ado it's your boy papa react and we built out a sick application loading notification all this kind of good stuff uh and yeah we absolutely oh my god look, what a way to finish it 800 likes so that's what i'm talking about 800 likes um someone goes that's my first stream that i finished amazing stuff Rupon. carson says send you an email today hope you see it soon appreciate you if anyone's in dubai feel free to hook me up that's awesome we'll go ahead and go for a coffee and um yeah amazing stuff thank you so much guys for tuning in and as always you know there's only one way to wrap these sessions up i love it honestly i love coding with you guys i love debugging with you guys 800 likes oh man what a session thank you so much for everyone for tuning in i'll leave it here for now you guys can see it for yourself the code will be uploaded to the github repo oh that's it i didn't add in the bloody sliders that's it it's fine it's in the github repo i've done this in every other build it's very easy you just add a plugin for the the sliders that's i knew it i knew there was something but yeah that's all i didn't add in in the end but that's in the github repo it's very simple to do it's a tailwind plugin it's easy right so feel free to check it out it's a little challenge for you all right uh as always guys on the drop i'm gonna call it and i'm just reading the final little um messages right now coming in one says this is my third time seeing you in the live stream warp says well done sonny i appreciate you patty thank you for tuning in and supporting always um hwb says win for the scraper exactly the scraper is awesome and uh, yeah thank you so much guys for tuning in i will see you in the next video peace that's it hop a family <laughs>